So we are going to get started here. Okay. Can I use your gap? Thanks. I know, right? Thanks all for coming out. Um, so I'm going to call this meeting to order. Uh, so the first thing is to review and approve the agenda. Um, I don't think there were any needed changes, or I, I hadn't heard of any suggested changes to the agenda. Uh, are there any um, comments or thoughts about changing the agenda? Okay, so without objection, we'll consider the uh, agenda approved. Um, so on to general business and appearances. So this is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council on an item that is otherwise not on our agenda. Uh, and if you would say your name and where you live and uh, try to keep your comments to two minutes or less, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Welcome. Hi. There, am I, can you hear me? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, good. Um, Elizabeth Parker, uh, 8 Hillside Avenue, here in Montpelier. And the first thing I wanted to say is bravo to Public Works for all their teamwork in getting the um, part of the multi-use bike path, uh, this side of the new bridge uh, running along Shaw's paved. I, I know that it took them a lot of work to talk to the state because of all the issues that are going on to be able to put temporary pavement down so that people who have been going to the old Shaw's um, bus stop can actually, and people who want to use uh, Shaw's can walk back and forth. Uh, so bravo to them. Um, the second thing I wanted to say is that uh, we had a um, resident who talked about the fact that uh, she wasn't allowed to make a deviation to the farmer's market at Caledonia. So I got in touch with GMT uh, about that, and they have resolved that issue so that it turns out that if someone wants to go to the farmer's market, they can take the city route midday between 9.20 a.m. and 2.30 p.m., ask for a deviation. So you can actually get on the bus um, here at the Transit Center, ask for a deviation to Caledonia, but you have to have called in advance to get a deviation back. Uh, and so I said, well, why can't the bus simply go to Caledonia as a matter of course on days when the farmer's market happens? And uh, I got the following response. Uh, let me see which part of it is. Here we go. Um, there's a concern that it would become a dedicated stop, which impacts their overall ADA service area. I don't exactly know what that means. Um, and uh, I guess that I don't really. And so then she talked about the fact, this is um, Jamie Smith from GMT. She talked about the fact that they'd already spoken with the farmer's market and made it clear that they couldn't do this this uh, regular deviation at that time. And, and so I have spent quite a bit of time on this, and I, I'm giving this to you all to <laughs> to ask about what this ADA service area means and why it's so limiting and why this accommodation can't be made because there are many people who are walkers who go to the farmer's market and it's great that we have the multi-use bike path but it's winter and it's cold and it's inconvenient and I feel that in order to make people, yep, okay, I'm stopping. You get the gist, <laughs> thanks. Thank you. Yeah, what's that? Uh, do you have an answer? Yes. Oh, oh. okay. Uh, if you have a fixed route yeah. and you you are required to deviate a quarter of a mile to mm -hmm. uh, pick up anyone with disability issues, so your fixed route has an obligation of a quarter of a mile. So if it becomes a fixed route, then they have an obligation a quarter of a mile on all sides of that route to pick up people. And so then it involves time. That's what it means. I, I, That's, I, I, I'm I just telling you what it means. That. I understand that, but I just... Feel that that is I, yep. Insane. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Uh, Steve Whitaker, Montpelier. I've spoken too many times uh, to no avail. I ask you to consider whether or not you're actually doing damage to faith and trust in government. Uh, we're letting our streets and our sidewalks decay and become unsafe. We're investing in what I call fluffy projects with somebody's vision of the future of Montpelier, which will likely gentrify and displace more Montpelierites. Um, we've had two shootings of mentally disturbed people. Uh, 
recently I've uncovered another incident with the same officer that could have been served as a warning sign where a woman's ribs were broken. Um, we've decimated a homeless, vulnerable homeless person's camp and take, taken little uh, to no responsibility for that. Um, I asked at the last meeting or two meetings ago about t formal city council action to insist that public records law be adhered to, and I was reassured, no, we're not going to take council action. The mayor's going to speak with the city manager and get it handled. It hasn't been handled. It has not been handled. I've gotten a couple more trickle of records, and we've got months old records requests. We've got an appeal to the head of the agency was sent to both of you, and it has not been responded to in the five day turnaround period. You're becoming outlaws. That is not okay. You know, you can't fly in the face of the laws that you're sworn to uphold. Um, the transit center is somewhat of a disaster person was hit there Friday night. Uh, at the crosswalk location next to the bridge is, is unsafe. Um, the garage fiasco, uh, the homeless ta homelessness task force was apparently loaded to the, its point of ineffective. Nothing of action has come out of that other than to, they'll ask for a few thousand dollars and continue for another year. The if the records requests are being delayed specifically to counter or delay press attention, that hits a new level. That turns into corruption, okay? I don't know the intent of these records requests going on for months now. There's about a dozen of them that have piled up and have not been responded to. So I'm sorry I don't bring you better news. That ball's in your court. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? Okay, uh, so on to the consent agenda. Um, uh, yes, Lauren. I just had one question about the wood floor refinishing. It looked like in it, it said if we bought our own, we could save a couple thousand dollars, but we're asking for the full amount and not buying it. And I was just wondering what the rationale was there. Do you know the answer to this? Um, I don't. Can, do you want to come up to the, the microphone? Okay. Thank you. I don't have a good answer for that question, and I apologize. I do know that we put this out for a couple of bids, and the refinishing um, was, we got two bids, one for 14000 and one for $7,000. Um, I think there might be cost savings if we get a, a, like a way to refinish our floors ourselves in the future, but right now we're just looking to replace the floors that exist. Yeah, yeah good. So, sorry. So, and maybe I was just misreading it, but it, I thought they said in the proposal, if you choose to just purchase and they send a picture and everything of the specific floor polisher yourselves versus having us buy it, it would save two thousand plus dollars. So it seemed like, sure, couldn't we go on Amazon and order it, or <laughs> go to Abishans if they have it, or? Um, but I, I might have misread. But that was the way I read. It. I don't know if anyone else saw that. I think it says if we're if we are willing to. Seal, if we're willing to polyurethane ourselves, we would save. Right. It would the be money. our labor. Right. So it's not just the purchase of supplies, okay. it would be the labor of actually refinishing the floor. We would, don't have anyone right now. I, who has if that's the case, I, that's what I was wondering if I was misreading. I, I thought it said just the literal purchase would save. Yeah, it's it's in the, money, it's like the okay. second to last sentence. It, it says, okay. Thank you for clarifying. Yeah. That's, yeah. Well, and you I'm can authorize up to, to the full amount. We can take a look and see if we can save some money. That'd be happy to do that, too. Okay. Okay. I mean, I guess, is there anyone in the city that can refinish a floor in the time frame allocated? That, that was not what no, I was I know. Well, about, yeah. No, I know. But Bill said we could do I that. Said we could take a look and see what's feasible, but I can't guarantee it. But. No reason to hold this up. As I'm saying is, if we can save it, we will. If we can't, we won't. But we can at least authorize the. <coughs> okay. Um, all right. Any um, discussion, or I should say, is there a motion regarding the consent agenda, or, or would anyone like to pull anything? Is there a motion? I move the consent agenda. Second. Second. Further discussion? Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, okay, so uh, we have some appointments to make. Uh, so for the Transportation Infrastructure Committee, I know um, 
Um, there's at least, uh, I think there's at least one person here um, for that. So uh, we have um, two expiring seats and three vacant seats. So we have a, a total of, of five seats uh, to fill. And there were applications uh, from three folks. Uh, and one was still, um, it was contingent on an employment opportunity. Um, so yeah, uh, if, you're, if you're here for an appointment to the Transportation Infrastructure Committee, if you would come up and introduce yourself and tell us about your interest in this uh, committee. I'm looking at you there. <laughs> I'm writing my response to Donna. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Hi, I'm Elizabeth Parker. Um, I uh, have been a Montpelier resident now for seven years. Um, I was away for 20 years, and so I lived here uh, back in the 90s as well. Um, I'm very much interested in uh, in transportation and in, um, in, in finding out solutions that work for everybody across the board, for residents, for business, and uh, uh, I have attended a few meetings and uh, I'm very much interested in the um, transportation plan uh, part of the city plan that is now uh, going to be discussed and um, I've had some background in um, in uh, uh, community um, I was a Marshfield Planning Commission and zoning administrator and raised half a million dollars to rehab uh, the old schoolhouse common uh, way back when and I've been on uh, numerous other boards since then so I'd really appreciate the honor of being able to serve thank you Thank you. Okay, and I don't see the other um, candidates here. If I'm wrong, uh, that's okay. All right. Um, so, is there a motion regarding uh, the appointments to the, uh, the Transportation Infrastructure Committee? I move that we reappoint Stephen Falbell and Constantinos Devaros and appoint uh, Hanif Nazarali and Elizabeth Parker. Second. Further discussion? I'm so proud of you with those names. <laughs> Very envious. Um, I, I suppose with uh, Constantinos, if he wants to step down because of an employment issue, he'll let us know. Right. Okay. I think it's all set. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> okay. Um, so, all right, uh, any further discussion? Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Thank you to, to you and the, those who are not here uh, for your time and dedication. Uh, yes. I would just like to thank Liz, especially because we're a little short on pedestrians in that committee, and and so that's you're you're a bicyclist, but you're also a pedestrian. I had a question about the dates. It, it, were we not trying to put everyone in a certain time of year? Half that was for planning and um, <coughs> zoning. I don't know about this. I can check on these dates though. Well, just because these are December, and the next group is November, and I thought that we were trying to work on all of them to be more in sync. Could, I'm sure we can arrange yeah. for that next time around. These are, okay. you know, legally binding, so we can yeah, 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 yeah. Adjust. Just it. want to bring it back up to the table. Thank you. No, that's great. I hadn't noticed that. Okay. Uh, all right. So, uh, to the uh, complete streets committee. So for that uh, committee, it looks like uh, there are uh, six openings. Uh, and I think there were five uh, total applicants. And with this one, there's uh, one of the uh, six available seats is one year term. So it would make sense to me, regardless, uh, that we might need to go into executive session to discuss that aspect of it, at, at the very least. So um, just want to flag that. Uh, but otherwise, um, if you're here for the appointment to uh, the Complete Streets Group, uh, we'd love to hear from you, have you introduce yourself. And I, I see um, some folks here. So welcome. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name's Dave Worry. I've lived in Montpelier. I'm fairly new, just been here a couple years. I work as an urban planner professionally, not in Vermont, but uh, mm -hmm. other places. And uh, I walk, I bike, I've got kids. I uh, really like that it's so easy to walk and bike around Montpelier and want to do my part to maintain that. And thank you for your time and attention to that. Cool, thank you. 
Okay, hi. Um, my name is Marianne Angel, and I'm on Main Street in Montpelier. I've lived here a little over a decade, and I've never served on a committee in for the city, or in, on a committee in this capacity, I should say. Um, I did attend a um, meeting last week, and um, to see um, more about, find out more about the um, committee, and um, I have an interest in having a safe environment for um, us to travel on bikes, on the streets, um, uh, sidewalks, and um, I personally want to be able to try to um, take advantage of that and get out and get more exercise and have that more of that social aspect available to the community to intermingle. And um, I... I just feel that I have good ideas and be able to follow through, and it's time for me to step up and take civic responsibility. And um, I guess that's pretty much, and just to give back to the community. So, great. Great. Thank, thank you, you. for the opportunity. Yeah. Nancy Scholes. I um, am wrapping up my first term on the Complete Streets Committee and have applied to renew. Um, I think we're um, in a great position now because we have um, had, we've heard from seven people um, who expressing interest in joining the committee. I don't know how many of them followed through with their applications, but I thought it was great that one post in Front Porch Forum generated that many responses. So it's an exciting time. It, I'm hoping to be reappointed and looking forward to having a complete, complete streets committee <laughs> for the first time, which would be um, nine members, and we just got a student from Montpelier High School. So non-voting, but that would be 10 of us. Very exciting. And um, I think we, we are doing great work. Um, I think we're all committed, whether we lean toward bicycling or walking or both. Um, I think everyone on the committee or applying for the committee is passionate about these things and about making Montpelier safer and uh, friendlier to pedestrians, um, people in wheelchairs, uh, people of all ages. And um, I look forward and I hope I get reappointed. Thank you. Thank you. OK. Um, is there um, a motion? Or I assume there's no one else here, or at least no one else I uh, recognize as um, being one of the other candidates. Uh, all right, so is there a uh, yes, Jack? Pursuant to 1 VSA section 313A3, <clears throat> I move we enter an executive session to discuss the appointment of a public officer. Second. Further discussion? Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, well, we will be right back. Out of executive session. So moved. Okay, further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, um, and do we have a motion? Yeah. Sure. I'd like to move that we appoint Phoenix Mitchell, Nancy Schulz, Marianne Angel, and David Ori for the two-year terms, and appoint Hanif as a rally to the one-year alternate. Pretty good. Pretty good. Pretty good. Okay. Is there a second? Second. <laughs> Further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 <laughs> Opposed? Great. Thank you. And thank you again for your dedication and your, your time. Service to the city. Okay. So uh, we have an update from the Public Arts Commission. Uh, and I know there's some folks here for that. So uh, come on up to the table. Welcome. Hello, we're um, two members of uh, the eight-member commission that you appointed eight months ago. I'm Bob Hannum. Rob Hitzig. Rob Hitzig. And Kevin has uh, been our guiding light uh, throughout. Anyway, we just wanted to um, briefly just tell you what we've been doing in hopes that will excite you to continue our work for another year. Um, first, I just want to applaud you for realizing that you know, a thriving arts community is really a backbone to a successful city, uh, to successful business, to growth. 
So um, with that, I just wanted to let you know, give you a brief outline. Kevin has given you material about detailing our work, but I just wanted to briefly go over it and just say that, um, you know, for the past eight months, we've been meeting a lot because um, we want to get our feet on the ground and do something um, to show for, um, for having appointed us. So we have been following the um, public arts master plan that you commissioned and set us to do. And in that plan, there are basically three tasks that we've been uh, given. And the first one is to identify and assess and create maintenance plans for the public art that we have, and that's been completed. Um, the second task is to create more public art in our city. And um, we have actually gone through a lot of different options, and we've settled on our first project, which we um, intend to, to uh, complete by July in cooperation with the arts festival that's happening in July. And thirdly, um, <clears throat> We're tasked with raising money so that the dollars that you give us can go a long way. And we are in the process of doing that. We wanted to have a project under our belts um, so that we have something successful we can talk about to potential donors. And that's been our work. Uh, we've done a lot of work. And so I'm um, appealing to you all to let us continue for another year. And. Um also, just to add to, add to what uh, Bob had mentioned, we are completing a piece of public art that is, was done many years ago, the, the vine sculpture that's in the alley between um, Zutano and the Blanchard Block. We've already ordered lights for that. That was originally intended to have lights, but nobody ever got around to doing it. So we've ordered lights, and we, we've just received them, and we intend to install it in the next couple of days. So that'll be completed. <laughs> You're going out tonight. <laughs> um, and as as Bob was mentioning, we we do intend to leverage other organizations in getting as much publicity and um, bang for a buck in these projects. One one of which we are working with uh, um, Paul Gamble's group for the the, the festival. This this um, summer, and we're also coordinating with uh, the 2020 Vision um, initiative that's put together. It's a statewide um, initiative put together by state curators, and um, that's also one of the organizations we're working with to, to leverage our bang for our buck. Uh, questions? Uh, Donna. Well, I really like the report. It reminds us how much we have sitting with, throughout the town and that they need attendance. So I, I really appreciate the report. I have a question about, you said you want to continue next year. We didn't appoint them just for one year, did we? Or were you, or you, were you really talking about the money for another year? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I thought. Okay. Well, and, and to that point, I mean, we're going to be starting our budget conversation yep. a little later this evening. So uh, I, I'm hoping that you weren't uh, looking for an answer just exactly now. Um, but uh, it is always good to hear, you know, about what that money would go towards uh, and sort of where y your vision is for uh, moving forward in the future. I like to have specific things to point at to say this is uh, what that money's going for rather than just some... Uh, you know, nebulous uh, thing that's um, a little bit in, not like vague or in, you know, not concrete. So, uh, so it's very, it's very helpful. Um, but we'll certainly have to uh, consider it together as a part with the the whole budget, um, for sure, um, as we get to it later on. Uh, Glenn, um, I want to thank you both uh, and the rest of the commission for for the work you've done and for coming tonight. Um, and I also want to, to say I'm really impressed with how much has, has been done and is being done, especially considering that um, we, we did fund it last year uh, with half the request. Uh, so I, I want to, to uh, remind council that um, we, uh, 
the, the recommended level of funding for this sort of thing is more than we're giving them, and they're doing pretty great work as it is. I, I think uh, we, should, we should try as hard as we can. I understand this year is a very tight year, but we should try as hard as we can to, to fund the Public Art Commission as, as solidly as possible. Uh, yes. How are you deciding uh, what to do for the public art? Uh, through our, our meetings that we're having on a monthly or more than monthly basis, we're discussing various projects and we, we've narrowed it down to initially doing this lighting project in the, the alley and we have a light projection project we're working on that will hopefully be unveiled this summer. Um, but uh, through our meetings, we're discussing various ways of, uh, and the public is welcome to come to our meetings as well. If you want. I mean, if you would say your, your name for the record. Um, I'm Heather Corey, and it would be neat to uh, maybe put something in the Guardian or something, giving some options for uh, the public to vote on. Whether it was like a mural or, um, yeah. um, well, I, well, I guess we'll talk about it at the meetings. So you're welcome to come okay. to meetings and we can talk about how. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank thanks. You. Uh, Don. So your report may basically goes over the things that exist and costs to repair them. Now, we started out with 50000 related to the contest with one Taylor Street. But maybe I missed it. Did you show us what's been spent on that? I mean, there's one place that says about $50,000 and 50% spent on your chart. But I don't really well, see, like, a budget with all these things listed. Right. The, the one Taylor Street project was prior to the commission forming. So, so you don't was, have that, any of that money, that, I see. That wasn't included in any of our calculations. We, yeah, we, we don't know anything about that. <laughs> uh, Glenn. Okay. Um, I think I can answer that, or at least it, the way I'm reading the, the uh, material that we got, um, the 50% of 50,000 is uh, one of the goals was get funded at fifty thousand yeah, dollars a year. We give them half, and we gave them half. So yeah. I think that's where Actually, that fifty percent twenty. Right, but maybe yeah, we, that's right. Yeah. We only give them twenty. <laughs> okay, it should be adjusted down. But I, I was asking about the allocation that yeah, was related to that, and I'm glad you reminded me it was yeah. before. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Any other? Oh yeah. Well, there was one outstanding issue as well that um, it, there was never a clarification as to where the money for maintenance was coming from. Um, with our tight budget, it's hard for us to allocate <laughs> the money from our allotment for maintenance, and we're hoping that the maintenance end of things was coming from additional funding. But um, anyway, that's that's an issue that we've we've been throwing around in the the meetings, and mm -hmm. want you to consider that yeah. uh, it's it's a. It's tough to make that work. Yeah. Well, thank you. Any uh, further questions for these guys? Okay. Well, thank you again, and uh, we'll, we'll be following up, of course. Thank you. All right, thanks. Okay. Oh, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we're going to uh, interrupt our regular schedule. Um, so, yeah. yeah. Phil. Um, Casey? Are you, you mind coming up for a second? Sure. Thank you. Um, that's my care. Or yeah, well, you can sit. I I, 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 I wasn't necessarily I, asking you to speak, but you may. I, sure. I wanted to right. apologize on behalf of the city for what happened to you. Um, Thanks. The, you know, the your things were taken inadvertently, and we are very. <laughs> I know you made. Thanks for bringing that one up. My God. But we're sorry about that. And we. Hey, listen, do you hang wallpaper professionally or are you just real good at whiteouts, Bill? Uh, well, I'm just trying to tell you that we. Yeah, did you've done a hell of a job with all that shit. 
By the way, thanks for actually figuring out what a hiring and maintenance crew means. You're welcome. Well, yeah. we are sorry for what happened, and thanks. we did try to make it right. Ow, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> you can have well, the mic anytime. And, and Casey, I want to uh, echo the same. And I'd, I'd love to chat with you about it later, too, no, if, you'd, that, if that'd be helpful. Because I did request it, and I totally do appreciate it. Yeah. I really actually do. Well, thank you. I did not appreciate paying $381 for carrying a damn knife around. I was only scraped resin with, but I fell over a curb years ago. And, I char and they charged me, first they said they were going to charge me $300 for violently assaulting a sidewalk. Then I had a meeting with somebody in your office, decided they were going to charge me more because I wasted their time. I paid $400 damn dollars for tripping over a sidewalk and exposing a knife I had for self-defense at a time when I had death threats. Okay? So I don't really like the way you run your shop, Bill. Well, I appreciate those comments. I'm not familiar with the event that oh, you're talking you're about. not, because you don't read paperwork. You don't know what you're doing, and no one in your office does either. Uh, Casey, if you'd Fair like, enough. I'd be happy to follow up with you also. All right, well, I hope you have a, a, a good night. Yeah, you too. Okay. Um, uh, yes. I just have a question about yes. the previous item. Oh, yeah, sure. I don't know, I don't remember enough about the the actual language for the art council. Do, the, do we decide the maintenance, what money goes to maintenance and what goes to new works? Or do we give them a certain amount of money and they decide? So is there a you way know, to look at that language? That, I'm not sure that last year there was any real definition. We gave them a total sum of money. Right. And I, I don't know. I, I was trying to see in the report if there was an estimated amount. We, I, I know, you know there's nothing we've got in the current budget proposal specifically for arts maintenance um, so we should probably talk with them about how much they think is appropriate and who and how and I don't know what's needed if it's specialists or something we can do or and, and again you know we have personnel shortages ourselves so right I would just like to look at the language to see if we need to modify it because I would like to see the maintenance under them you know uh, but maybe I'm wrong, but I would like to at least look at that language and see what it would need to change it. So, so what you're, uh, just to clarify, so what you're saying is that you want them to be able to decide um, like how much money ought to go to maintenance. Rather well, that than it's one of their decide? responsibilities, yeah, and yeah, they yeah. can decide yeah. of that this is how much we're going to do in maintenance, this is how much we're going to do for new work. Right. Yeah. I don't want to, I would prefer not to see it separated so that we're doing maintenance and they're doing new works. I think you have to do new works with maintenance in mind. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, that's fair. Would you like an answer? Oh, yeah, sure. That'd be great. If you, if you wouldn't mind coming up to a mic, though, that'd be great. Thank you. Yeah, we, we have actually assessed all the current public art in our city. Mm -hmm. There's about 20 pieces, and that doesn't count private pieces or state-owned pieces. So, um, and of all those pieces, we just need about a couple of thousand a year to take very good care of them. Now, the other option is that we could approach the public works department and see if they have the, the expert, well, doesn't really need expertise to do this actually, but if they'd be willing to do it, it's another option. Interesting. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Bob, right? Yep. I guess from when you were talking at the table, I thought you were asking us to come up with more money for maintenance or to make this decision. Do you understand what your language of your charge, does it include maintenance? We're not sure either. Uh, we assume that to do it. I, I, I can actually speak to this too. So in the, um, in the approved public art master plan, um, it was pretty, it was actually clearly laid out is that one of the key pieces is to separate from um, a public art uh, commission's role is, is keeping maintenance separate as a separate line item from an appropriation. So that that was actually one of the key pieces is because as time goes on, any approach, appropriation can get eaten up by all of the, the maintenance and then there is no new work. Okay, that's good to note. But you, so you have a separate line item for maintenance, a separate line item for new work. 
but but do, but they basically oversee both. It's within their charge. Uh, well, it's it it is and it isn't. It is um, it 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 is a in their charge that they make sure that it is done. Uh, it's not necessarily in their charge that they they take it from their appropriation. Do you understand? Yep. So that's. I just want to say though, that in the public art master plan, that it was separated. Yeah, I'll go back and read it. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. That's that's helpful. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Connor. Quick question. I, I don't even know if it's considered art, but the Challenger Memorial over by National Life. I know this came up a few years ago. Uh, talking about moving it, maybe. Is that actually owned by the city, or is it a National Life monument? Uh, I believe it's owned by the city, but these folks may know better. I don't know. That's it didn't come, didn't come up in the, these. Yeah, no, that's a... Uh, I feel like I'm finding out new pieces as I go <laughs> right. along. They're hidden. But, uh, yeah. They're hidden. I will well, find out. Yeah, I believe it, I believe it is them. the city's, and it was National Life agreed to have it on uh, the National Life property, and some years ago they indicated that they wanted to use that space maybe for a sign or something. And... Um, at the time, actually, our current public works director was working for our public director, and she was working with a committee to find a new location, and it kind of died down, and now it's come back up again. Right. So um, I don't think there's anything imminent, but it is on in some back burner discussion to find a different location. But I do believe it is the city's. I'll find out and clarify for you all. Great. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Any further questions on uh, public art? Okay. All right. Thank Just you. Trying to leave. <laughs> <laughs> you may leave. I won't talk anymore. I promise. Okay. Uh, so we have a, a interim river uh, hazard map amendment to discuss. Uh, welcome. Good evening. I'm Mike Miller. I'm the planning director. And um, what I have is a quick. Um, discussion tonight um, this is this will be a hearing for next week uh, what we have is uh, the river hazard regulations which were adopted at the same time as the zoning but they're a separate set of regulations set separate set of rules um, and we adopted those changes in 2018 in January and since that time we have been issuing permits and this summer we had a couple of items, a couple of projects that came up that seemed like reasonable projects that we're going to have difficulty being able to approve. And so we felt the appropriate thing to do would be to go back and to see whether some changes needed to be made to the rules to, to allow projects to move forward. Um, one of those projects is on Cumming Street. And if you looked at the map that was attached to the memo that I sent out, it's not perfectly clear, but you can see where there's Elm Street. And if you follow the green, you see it crosses over Cumming Street. Well, that's the area that's in the river hazard area, in the river corridor. And according to the way the maps are supposed to be drawn, they are supposed to stop when they hit a road. Um, your river corridor is the area, rivers naturally meander across the landscape. And what the state has tried to do is to get municipalities to adopt these river corridors to give rivers room to move. But one of the rules they have is if that river moves and hits a road, we're not going to go and discontinue the road. We're going to protect the road and let it work within the bounds of these roads. Um, and if you look throughout the rest of our corridor, that's the way it's been mapped. For whatever reason, it got missed on Cumming Street, and it turns out we didn't notice it because it was such a minute thing on a large map that we never really noticed it until somebody came in with a project and they can't do the addition on their house because it would expand into the river corridor. So that's the reason for that change. It really is um, a, a very straightforward. It shouldn't have been in the district at all, so we're going to recommend taking it out. The second set of changes that are in here are also discussing the river corridor, that, that river channel that moves. And what we had was um, we, we did have rules about accessory structures, but it turns out it really didn't work in all situations. And what was a very simple project turned out to be something that we had a difficult time approving. It was just a, sh a shed cover for somebody's um, sand pile. 
he <laughs> works doing sanding and plowing and he needs a place to store his sand for the winter it's a low value structure has low value content it is more than 50 feet from the river but it is in the river corridor and so we felt we we could amend those rules clarify them a little bit and to make sure they, that you know it wasn't something that could be abused in another situation but would allow for some reasonable accommodations for these types of projects low value projects with low value contents, we should be able to approve such a structure. So that's what you have before you is, um, because it takes a long time to adopt permanent, we thought we would start with these interim changes, and if they work, we would be back at some point to do a full adoption process to adopt them. Uh, Jack and then Ashley and then Donna. So you'll develop some kind of uh, form for the acknowledgement of the inherent risk to property as part of the process? Yes, we felt that that, um, that made a lot of sense that, that we should have that included. Um, as you can see, it was one of the additions, and we felt if we were going to start to allow these things, we had to have people acknowledge that this is a risky area. Thanks. Um, did I hear correctly you said um, you wanted to look at what, pro what, what was standing in the way of projects? Did I, is that? Um, it turned out there were two specific projects that came in. We've had a number of projects that have come in that could meet these rules and um, or were adjusted so they didn't have to be in the river corridor. But these were two specific projects. Um, one was to put um, potentially an accessory apartment onto an addition in their house. Um, and that, that project was not going to be allowed because it was in the river corridor, even though it was on the other side of the street. And then this other project came up um, in a different part of the river corridor. I, I thank you for the explanation. I just, I don't like to assume things. I think what I am struggling with is changing things in response to particularized requests. And um, I guess what makes me uneasy is, you know, I've driven uh, a lot lately and there was some pretty significant flooding north of here. I know the river rose here quite a bit, but we did not flood. But um, parts of Colchester, Essex, I mean, we're talking like lots and lots and lots of water like covering entire fields. And I, I am hesitant. I mean, I know 50 feet is it's 50 feet, which in the grand scheme of things is not that much, but on the flip side, I guess if we want to preserve our waterways and, and we are invested in sort of keeping space open because natural events happen, I'm what I'm struggling with is, is we, I think we talked a lot about the 50 foot restriction, if I am correct, when we went through this the first time around. And so I'm, I'm struggling with changing it now. And, and then sort of doing it as a piecemeal process. Um, because I, I could see changes, you know, it, to certain parcels where, you know, that might not be something that we ever intended to allow. But, um, and I know, I think I know the answer. I know no one likes the variance process. Mm -hmm. Is this something where we could simply add you know, a, a variance option. So, you know, if your project meets these criteria, you can apply for a variance as opposed to a blanket change. So uh, to kind of answer the first part of your question, um, when we get applications where something gets, something doesn't meet the rules and gets disapproved, you, we have a very careful and deliberate discussion of, you know, is this the intent of what we wanted when we adopted these rules? Um, in some cases, the answer is yes. This absolutely is not a project we wanted to have happen. This is, you know, in other cases, we look at them and say, you know, this isn't what we intended. Is it? Is it worth making that change for just this one project? Um, in this case, we really looked: would we want to allow this to happen in other places? Which is why you saw a number of different additional requirements that were added in. We didn't strike any requirements or remove any requirements. We actually added additional requirements to, to some of the lesser ones um, before allowing this new one. So we already allowed things less than 480 square feet. Mm -hmm. This one happened to be 
larger than 480 square feet because it had to fit the salt pile. And we were and, and we felt if there were certain conditions which we outlined, then that could be okay. Um, a little bit to get to your second question, what we did add was on uh, number four is actually a waiver, which is what you would think of as a variance. So variances are very difficult under state law to issue. Mm -hmm. So we did allow for a waiver provision that if somebody wanted to have more flexibility, they could go to the Development Review Board and they could request some flexibility, provided they met these restrictions that we outlined. Um, Can I ask a follow-up sure. question to that? Uh, my read, though, of subsection 4 is they can request a variance in relation to the new 711D2B and 711D3B, so that would be an additional variance from the change, right, from the proposed change that's before us right now. So they could deviate further, and so I guess I, I understand what you're saying in terms of the, the variances being restrictive under state law, and I know we talked about sort of the, the goal of streamlining as opposed to making people request a variance. I I am uncomfortable with with having the, the new proposal, which would um, sort of allow for this other type of development um, but then also going even further and opening that up once again and saying, well, you know, we also, we're going to change this, but then you can also apply for more than what's here. And I, I understand that there are criteria, but I have learned that um, sometimes less is more. And I just, I, this is, this is not something that I support uh, for a, a myriad of reasons, but um, that part in particular, so there's the expansion, and then there's that sort of like extra, it's like an expansion plus. Um, and that makes me uh, a little uneasy given, um, you know, certainly the city wants people to be able to use their property as it is, but I think we as, as the governing body here have an obligation to ensure public safety and to, you know, to make sure that structures when they are built are able to be insured um, because if there is damage, people are going to need to replace that or <coughs> sort of deal with the fallout of an event. Um, but I also, um, again, I really don't, I really struggle with changing things because something comes up. I would, I would much prefer a more thoughtful approach. You know, why did we do this in the first place like this, versus a, a reactionary. You know, well, they want these projects, and if we do this, then those can happen. Yeah. Okay. And we usually don't look for hypotheticals. So they, we usually don't discover problems until somebody comes up with an application and. <laughs> I, I took an opposite approach. I was pleased to see these are new rules and we don't know how they're going to impact until we have a project. So I like seeing this because you kept in all three stances the structure is not within 50 feet of the stream or river bank and likewise is no closer than the existing principal structure. So to me, you kept protections in that really limits it, but by the same token, after you've gone through your thoughtful process, you realize, oh, we missed this. I feel well, we're going to be doing this with our zoning until we apply it for a while. So I'm in favor of it. So. Yeah, and the, the reason, if I could just follow up a little bit on the, the reason why we put the exception in for, the, for just B, which is, new structures cannot be closer than the existing principal structure is we have a couple of properties on Elm Street where all of the single family homes are outside of the river corridor, but all of their backyards are in it's the river corridor. So we, as we were talking about looking at this and thinking about what we might see in the future, we started thinking, what if somebody wanted to put a garden shed in their backyard? We can't do it as we currently have it written because it would be closer to the river than the principal building. So we just looked at a number of them and said, you know, I, we can see this one coming, and so let's put the waiver in because then we can go through and say, we are, you know, we can limit the size of the structures, the number of the structures. We can say it's got to be the minimum. So you can't go, you can have that shed, but you might not have it next to the, or, you know, if you have 100 feet, we might say, well, you can't have that shed at the 50-foot mark. 
we're going to want at the 75 foot mark we've got a way of having some right to say where that small shed or swimming pool or something else that might go in the backyard because that's what somebody could potentially have on on elm street is they want to put a swimming pool in their backyard and we'd have to say no and we felt before somebody comes in and we've got to amend the rules again, we thought this was a great opportunity for us to, to rethink about our rules. Um, and then because we had had accessory apartments discussed, we wanted to make sure it's clear that whatever structure goes in there shouldn't be habitable. And that was why we put the extra rules that said no more. It can be an accessory structure, but it couldn't be an accessory apartment mm -hmm. in that area. Other thoughts? Yeah, if you have more, I might make a motion. If it's no more discussion. Well, I, I have ahead. some thoughts, but uh, yeah. uh, Lauren, go ahead. Yeah. Well, go ahead first. Um, I, I have something to say too. Go ahead. Um, one question to start. So, um, Ashley had raised the question of insurance. Would these be insurable at this point? If you're building, it's, what are the restrictions? It's not on? our. Um, we don't we don't get into the in, insurance and whether something is insurable or not. Um, there, so there are within a river hazard area a number of different lines that are in there, and they, they tend to overlap. They're not exclusive. You're going to have the flood hazard area, which is identified based on as water comes up to a certain point, what area is covered. That could be wider or narrower, depending on um, what the terrain is like. Um, so you'd have the river corridor, and within that, you've got the flood way. So you've got the area where the water moves the, f the fastest, so that's usually right up next to the river channel. So within the flood hazard rules, those are your FEMA flood hazard rules, that's one district in your river hazard area. The river corridor is a second one. That's the one that's looking at as the river moves. So these, both of these projects that we were talking about were not in the flood hazard area. They were only in the river corridor, which meant they're above the flood stage. They will not flood in a flood. Um, in a 100-year flood. If it exceeds a 100-year flood, I have no... Hashtag challenge accepted. Yes. <laughs> they won't flood in, in those 100-year events, um, but they would both be theoretically subject to a river moving, undermining the bank and dropping them in the river. Um, that's, so that's the difference between those two. Um, so the insurance, there yeah. is an insurance tying to the flood hazard piece because communities and individuals are only eligible for insurance if we adopt and enforce our FEMA, the flood hazard rules consistent with the federal guidelines, which we do. Okay. Um, thanks for that explanation. Um, yeah, I mean, just thinking about, so there's the 100 year floods. We know in this era of climate change, we're gonna see more extreme flooding more often, so I really, don't like us encouraging development in flood prone areas. I think, I mean, I, lots of work I'm doing in other capacities are looking at how do we take structures out of flood river corridors and so on. So to say that, you know, we're moving in the opposite direction really concerns me. Um, I, I understand the intent here and how frustrating it must be if you live in, um, in a home that is restricted in this way, but it's it's areas that if we were developing a new city now, you know, <laughs> you would probably look at certain, uh, have some different criteria perhaps. So I, I, I just do have some concerns about, you know, there might be ways of tightening this up. I mean, even something like a garden shed, what are you storing in there? Is it stuff that we want washing into our river? I, I, there might be tightening up of, you know, even further of what, what exactly are we permitting, but I, I err towards more not wanting to open up new development in these areas, personally. So I know, Jack, you had something to say too, but I'm going to jump on that comment as well because that that was my thought um, as well. Um, I was similarly worried about encouraging construction um, near the near the river. Similarly, um, to that end, uh, particularly with anything related to uh, uh, changes in. Uh, the, the river hazard um, uh, codes, uh, you know, the ordinance documents, that sort of thing. I would love to be getting input on that from the Conservation Commission. Uh, I would love for them to just have a, an opportunity to do a once-over and see if they have any concerns about the language. I mean, that's um, 
that's that's just me. But uh, and then similarly, I was worried also about uh, the contents of uh, of the shed. So not the shed, but whatever it was, right? So I, um, the the fact that it, the language um, currently says uh, used for storage of low value contents um, is. On the one hand, I, I mean, I understand why that would matter because if it's at a risk to be destroyed, then uh, you know, has, have, what's the what's the loss there? But um, I, uh, I'm also interested in, uh, you know, <laughs> what type of hazardous chemicals are we uh, keeping uh, in the the um, a flood prone area? Uh, so, uh, I before. Uh, I would love to see that language be modified to reflect that somehow, if that if that's a reasonable uh, request. Um, and then one further thing um, is just that uh, in two B and two and three B, I think that's the wrong principle. It's Did I grab the wrong. Mm -hmm. I think it should be the other principle. It should be the P A L. Uh, in 2B and in 3B. Meaning the principle should be the P-A-L. Yes, yes. Oh, I, I, yeah. The wording. Yeah. Sorry, I know that's super. Principle. No, it's I think particular. It's I, I think that's principle structure right. would be P-L-E. I think that's right. It's primary. Is it? It's the principal yeah. structure as opposed yeah. to your pal. It's a principal <laughs> person. Right. Well, isn't... Am I wrong? No, I'm wrong. I just looked at the definitions. Duh. Okay. I, I, I probably have that mistake a lot of places. No, I, <laughs> I think I'm with you, you Mayor. You agree with me? Well, right, I do. But if, but, well, okay, now I'm going to look it up again. The principal idea, the main idea is L-E. Yes, correct. Uh, but if you okay. look up G-A-L, the first definition is first in order of importance. A principal P-A-L structure. That is true. Yeah. I learned it's the, uh, too. Did you look up the other one and see if it doesn't say I the same see. thing? Yep. Yeah. I know. There you go. Oh, we learn something all the time. <laughs> Tom's shaking his head. <laughs> so, so, okay, well, in, well, in any case, at least it's a... Uh, so you talked as if yes. we can control what people store in their sheds? Well, like that's your garage. The I mean, I, there's certain rules, right, the state says about flammables or whatever, but... Can we control? Well, that's a good question. I don't know. Okay. And I, I'm willing to concede that maybe we can't. <laughs> yeah. And I, um, just so we're clear, the when I mentioned that there were the, these two separate or three separate things that kind of overlap and can shift back and forth, um, the rules are cumulative. So if it's in the river corridor and the flood hazard area, it would have to meet those flood hazard area rules as well, which would prohibit the storage of those types of materials. Okay. And if it's outside, as in the case that we were looking at here, um, it's a structure that is above the flood stage um, and 50 feet. So our thought is that would enter the river if the river moved 50 feet, which I think in most cases in this city, that would be a tremendous event to move a river 50 feet. Uh, Ashley. Um, Oh, 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 actually, before you yeah. Jack, did you have something further? I, I do. Yeah, if go, she, go for if it. She's nope. directly responding to what you've got going on. I'm happy. Is this in response? Is this on it, the same topic? It is. Okay. I think the only other thing that I would raise is, you know, with a 450 square foot accessory structure, I mean, that could do damage to abutting property owners as well. And again, I'm, I'm, I try not to generally be like the worst case scenario, er, but. That, I mean, that is the that's a, a pretty significant addition to a parcel. And then if you have neighbors that are abutting, and you know there's a major weather event, it, it just it seems like kind of the same thing that there might be unintended damages to abutting or attendant properties that, you know, that those landowners are going to have to address. You know, and I, I just I'm not sure that that's what we were looking to do. Uh, Jack. Um, in general, I think that uh, what we're doing here is very similar to what we did earlier this year with the zoning ordinance, where uh, we uh, the city found a series of uh, things that were 
unanticipated that didn't allow for for uh, for desirable uses and needed to uh, make changes in order to enable those desirable uses to uh, to occur and we had this you know fixing the zoning fixes as we kept calling them and the uh, and the steep slopes issue and so I think this is uh, <coughs> a good good idea to be doing whether it's the exact right language I don't know but I I would I'm certainly going to support uh, going forward and scheduling this for a for a public hearing um, the question that occurred to me is we've been talking about this and you and you mentioned a garden shed is that uh, there are garden there are small buildings below a certain size that people don't even need uh, to right. get a permit for so how would someone know whether they're if whether they're allowed to do it or not um, the one of the big reasons that we decided to move the river hazard regulations outside of the zoning was because um, of the exceptions that exist to zoning in many cases don't apply to river hazards so in most zoning bylaws if you look at it say except in the flood hazard area a garden shed less than 100 square feet doesn't need a permit well in the flood hazard area it does so it actually becomes confusing to some people who are, are doing things when we separated it out it becomes a lot clearer because everything all development in the flood hazard area needs a permit so even the smaller even the smaller projects so um, people are expected to know that or if they if they call the city and say hey I've, I'm doing this little thing do I need a permit for it you'll tell them well you don't need a zoning permit but but you do need the river hazard river permit hazard. because we have to make sure that the structure is going to be anchored. If it were, say, a small shed, we would say, that's great, make sure it's anchored, and you'll have to bring in a permit, and we will we'll be looking at that aspect of it to make sure it doesn't float away. Um, so those are usually the, the pieces that we look at. And we always encourage, and anyone who listens, if, if you have a project idea, always just email my office. That's what we always encourage people to do because then we have a written record that goes and says, hey, I wanted to put in a shed, and we can look and say you're not in the flood hazard area or where you're looking to put it is not in the flood hazard area, so you can just go ahead and do it. But it's always good to contact us first because we can confirm you don't need permits, and then you have something in writing. Thanks. Okay. Um, what's your desire, team? Uh, is there a motion regarding setting the first hearing for next time? Would you like to send it to Conservation Commission um, or not do it at all? Um, also, I stand by my <laughs> thing about principle. Yes, yes, I actually have even a better yes. definition. I was going to say, my I have a better definition that the one with the pile, P-A-L, is a noun and an adjective, but the P-L-E is only a noun and refers to high moral ground. So your principle is your pile, but it, friend, it's my <laughs> southern accent, sorry. <laughs> it's great. If you have a P-A-L, it can also mean a description of something to be main, more important. So you're right. Well, thank you. Uh, and Tom? Uh, Tom Brown from Montpelier. I apologize for my outburst. The mayor is correct. <laughs> 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 wow. You All gotta right. give it to her sometimes. That's the PLE kind. <laughs> and, 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 <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes. Yes. Stand, Stand, by your, okay. Stand by your principles. So. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Or try to be flexible, my Mike. Yeah. Well, re regardless, so what I is I can, I can search for that typo to see where else it exists. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Donna, go ahead. Well, I would like to go ahead and make a motion to have a first hearing, and meanwhile, we can talk to the conservation. Well, there, will, there, there only needs to be one, but you can always have more. Just so you oh. know, this isn't one that needs to be adopted through the two <coughs> readings process. Um, because it's an interim change, it can it can be adopted with one hearing. But it's up to you how many you want to have. But if it's an interim change, doesn't that mean that it has to be formally adopted later? It, it It's effective for two years. Oh, okay. And then would have to be, at sometime within that two-year period, would have to be formally adopted. Okay. And you're thinking within that two period, we would do a more inclusive adoption? Yeah, I would of expect everything, not yes. just this. Um, well, these are the only changes. If we find any other changes at, at that time, we probably would, would look at that. Um, 
but knowing um, in this case, we felt it's a little more timely to do them on an interim basis because there were existing projects, one of which was looking at the ADU program that we have going on, and they can't advance their project until they can get their permits. And so if we wanted to go through a, a four-month process of revising the map, that would mean they wouldn't be able to advance the, the ADU project. So that's, that's why we voted to go with an interim rather than the full adoption process. So I, okay. we'll see if it passes. <laughs> I'll make a motion <laughs> that we uh, set our first public hearing at our next meeting, which is December 18th, to, de to do, uh, approve the proposed interim river hazard area amendments. Second. Is the Conservation Commission going to meet before then? Or? I think, ironically, I think they are meeting at the exact same time. <laughs> They're meeting over in the <laughs> manager's conference room because I had to meet with them, and I was like, well, I guess I'm already going to be here as long, except for, uh, but for this, I will be able to go over and meet well, with them. Maybe we can ask them to, maybe we just put it later first on the on agenda. Theirs. and Put it first on theirs. Uh, exactly. On <laughs> <laughs> just pop over Get it and done. say how that, how that went. Yeah, it's actually um, already warned because it had to be a warned hearing. It's actually already warned for 645, so we already know when it will be next week. Oh, okay. Unless you decided not to do it. Yeah, right. Uh, okay, um, fair enough. Uh, that works for me if we can hopefully get them to uh, take it up early. Uh, so, uh, any further discussion? Um, yeah. Do you so just, just on this point of like what you could store, so it sounds like in flood hazard areas, there are restrictions on what you're allowed to store. I mean, is that something that you think from your perspective could be appropriate or could be applicable here? Or do you see challenges with um, just kind of dropping similar language into this? We could certainly review it. Our concern, we knew, knowing this was built 50 feet from a bank, we figured it's gonna take a bit of time for that to probably meander its way over to whatever structure it is. Um, but uh, we certainly could look at what is in the existing limitations for the flood hazard area and replicate that in this case. I would have to do a little bit to look up where it is. I can't off the top of my head grab the numbers. One possibility is that maybe we just add a reference in the section to wherever <laughs> Uh, has the the list spelled out or uh, yep. those regulations spelled out? Um, uh, is is that oh, okay? How do you feel about that? Uh, those who made that motion, we can make modifications at yeah. the first hearing. That's fair. So, that's, yeah, that's a good point. It's true. It's not really a part of this motion necessarily. So okay, cool. Any further conversation? All right, uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yep. All right. Okay, and on to the winter parking ban ordinance amendment um, for Sibley and Prospect uh, Street. So this is the first public hearing, so I am going to officially open the uh, public hearing. Uh, and. Uh, I, and yeah, if, so are there any comments from counselors or the public? Well, I know there, <clears throat> there's a couple of people from the public that want to comment, but I just say in general, this was done because we had discovered there were a couple areas where it was difficulty for vehicles to get through when snow banks existed and under storm conditions and for emergency vehicles. So uh, we raised this once before. Council asked us to notify nearby residents, which was done, and that's why we're here. Great um, comments. I'm Heather Corey, and I live on Sibley Ave. And I was wondering, um, why is it more difficult to move the snow on that part of Sibley Ave than other streets? Um, is this for the whole winter? a parking ban for the whole winter for Sibley and Prospect. And um, if it has been difficult to move the snow on particular streets, why not make it a two-day parking ban for those locations? Um, 
I lived there last winter and it seemed like we needed a parking ban about uh, once a week was how much I had to move my car. Um, currently, I myself am able to park in a friend's driveway, but I don't really foresee that happening all winter long and I'm not really sure of like the safe locations where I can park my vehicle at night and walk back every single evening. Um, I rent, I don't have a driveway to park in. Um, there is one that the landlords use, but they are able to get up with, you know, big strong trucks and stuff, and my vehicle can't do that. Uh, I just, um, I think it would be simple enough, you know, if the, I understand it's a lot to plow in the winter, I think it'd be simple enough for the city to add yet one more alert to our streets to say, the parking ban is in effect for, or no longer in effect, except for Sibley Avenue, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. Great, thank you. Hi, I'm Valerie Lewis. Um, I live at 1 Sabin Street. Uh, so I'm on the corner of Sabin and Sibley. I grew up on lower uh, Sibley Avenue. So I grew up on the area that we're talking about. Um, and I'm here to ask you to amend the parking, uh, winter parking ban ordinance for lower Sibley only. I don't think it's a problem at the top of the hill. It gets much wider up there. But I grew up on the street, and I'm down in that area every day because my mother still lives in that house. And it gets very, very congested in the winter. It's bad enough any time of the year if you've driven up there and tried to go around the corner when someone's coming down the street. You know how tight it gets. In the winter, the snow gets pushed out. And particularly in front of my mother's house, there was a repair, a temporary repair made to the sidewalk several years ago. And it was intended only to be temporary because it was crumbling pretty badly. They weren't able to do a regular curb there, and so they had to slope it. And so anyone parking in front of there parks a little farther out because the curb is sloped. So that's pretty close to the corner. And it, the snow just, when it gets pushed out, you've got people coming down the hill, many of whom really don't like to stop at the base of College Street. And then you've got people trying to come up around the corner, and it just gets really dangerous. Um, there, are, there are times when it's almost terrifying to try to get out of my mother's driveway at 8 and 10. Um, I think that anybody who doesn't have a place to park um, could park farther up the street because I don't think there, there is a problem from College Street up to Sabin. It's just that small section that just is really hazardous. Um, and I just live in fear that somebody's going to get hit and there's going to be a real, you know, a real bad accident there. So, uh, and we have made an offer. Um, for our neighbor uh, when our driveway is available to park in our driveway. Um, because we, we try to park in the driveway and leave space out on the street for that particular house doesn't have a lot of parking. Everybody else does. Um, but we, we have made that offer. But I think that you would be able to park up the street and it's pretty safe because I walk the street every night back and forth between my house and Sibley. So thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you. Does she have your number? <laughs> Does she have your number? She's got my cell number. Okay. <laughs> okay. Very nice of you. Good evening. My name is Stephen Cohen. I'm a resident at 46 Prospect Street. Um, my wife and I own 46 and 48. We're a duplex. Uh, we have two families, including ours. Uh, we're a four car household. Um, we all commute, um, which we know is a challenge here in Vermont, getting around transportation, we talked about earlier this evening. Um, uh, it would be a pretty massive inconvenience for us to, we have two off-street parking spots, so we split those between our units. Um, it would be a pretty massive inconvenience for us as well as the 
other three to four cars that are typically on the street every night um, that don't have driveway parking. Um, the closest place to prospect to legally park is down here at City Hall, um, in the same places that are reserved for uh, off-street parking during the parking ban. Um, I know a lot of us leave really early and come home really late uh, based on our work, commuting and working service industry jobs and things like that. Uh, so it's kind of a schlep, especially in the winter. There's ice. I don't know if anybody's been up Prospect Street walking up that hill, uh, but it can be fairly treacherous, um, especially when there's no lights and it's black ice. Um, the other piece that I've heard come up about this uh, amendment is that it's in regard to um, creating more passageway for emergency vehicles, which I think is interesting because the section of street that the non-ban applies to, um, even when there are cars parked there, isn't even close to the most narrow point on the street. There are points on the street that are two to four feet uh, more narrow than that section with cars. So if emergency vehicles coming up is a concern, the cars parked in that area of the road are the least of the concern. Um, yeah, it's two feet on, I took measurements this morning before I came up here. It's two feet on the, uh, at the intersection with Cherry, and then coming up the other side off of Hill Street, um, I don't know really if an emergency vehicle could make that turn. It's, uh, it's steeper than a 90 degree turn and on a pretty steep hill, so that would be pretty challenging. So yeah, I asked that, I, I like your idea about, um, you know, potentially keeping it with, um, you know, you call for a ban, if you need more time to remove snow in those areas that are a little bit challenging, extend the ban. Like, we're all pretty reasonable about moving our cars off the street when there is a ban, so, you know, we're flexible, but it'd be pretty inconvenient to have to park at City Hall for three and a half months out of the year every night. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Hi, I'm Stephanie Quaranta. I live on Berlin Street, but my family owns um, the 8 and 10 Sibley, so I have 61 years of experience on that street. Um, I've also worked for 39 years in municipal government between Barrie and Montpelier, so while some of the suggestions of like additional parking ban times sound great, but financially, somebody's got to go out, put all these, you know, tags, notify people, you know, it's a lot of labor for that. Whereas right now, like Sibley as an example, it was so frustrating that the <clears throat> snow banks got so big, but yet if there was a ban on that part, okay, so like a weather like this, DPW is not out sanding salting today, but they could take a crew out tonight without a lot of, you know, their, you know, possibly not overtime, maybe shift differential, but get out there and clear that um, and keep it, you know, just a lot safer. So the corner of Sibley, it gets wide. You can't see around it. Um, you know, Heather, wonderful person. I understand that part, but from Sib the bottom of college to the corner of Sibley, you're talking like three and a quarter houses, and we own one of them. Um, we have folks from the legislature that stay there. They all go up the driveway, and it's been pretty scary sometimes, them even trying to get in. Um, one of the gentlemen is handicapped, and there is just no way he could even park on the street if he had to. So um, I'm just asking, please, after you know many years of experience with that street, to please consider. And again, our household would be one that would be impacted, but um, for the safety. Every night I'm there. And I'm, I'm fearful, push the mirrors in. Um, I'm even afraid getting out. I'm there like, um, you know, five o'clock, six o'clock. And um, I think you're in that area. Who's the um, representative? What well, do you call I, them here? Alderman or whatever? Yeah, I, I do, but, I'm not, but I don't live there. But, but I go by there all the time, okay. so yeah. I so no does, it, does anyone travel that? Yes. Well, it's like, okay. Right so anyway, my house. I won't keep you and keep rambling. I know the two-minute kind of rule. You know, I've, I've been on the other side of the table. So thank you. And anytime, Heather, you still can park. <laughs> thank you. Any uh, further comments? Okay. Comments from council. Or uh, did you have something you wanted to follow up? Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, there's still many, many days in the winter where we don't have 
treacherous conditions and we already park pretty far from that corner of Barry and Sibley. I don't really see the difference between the conditions on Sibley Ave in the winter and, for example, Barry Street. Um, I know you don't have control over drivers' behaviors, but um, people are pretty generous uh, driving away from the side of the road and taking up more space than not really allowing another car to get by. I often see people driving about four feet from the cars parked on the side, and uh, people can drive slower in the winter as well. Um, and I know this would be a different um, thing to address that's separate from the parking ban. Perhaps the challenges of Sibley Ave should be more about changing that part of the street to a one-way rather than a two-way. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, Ashley. Uh, so I used to live right down the street from here at 178 um, Barry, and I take uh, Sibley every day to get home. And um, I am a renter, and I've lived in places with no parking. And um, I I understand why, because I too have had many a uh, closer call than I feel comfortable with at that intersection. Um, but I, I am, the, the sort of question that's been like playing over and over in my mind is like, what, what is the, the crux of the issue? And I mean, that intersection has existed that way for, I mean, I've lived here for five years, six years now, and it's been like that ever since I can remember. It was like that when I used to come up here when I was a kid. And so, you know, we've always had snow. We've always had cold, miserable weather. <laughs> Um, and, you know, but when you rent and you have to walk, I mean, I used to live in Boston and I would have to park like seven, eight, nine blocks from home and have to walk home alone, which I don't feel safe or comfortable doing. And I used to live on that section of Barry Street and I was uncomfortable walking from downtown Montpelier home. Um, and I understand that that is a dangerous corner, but I feel like to me, the question more is, is this an issue year round? In which case, I think we would have one approach to it, but it seems like this is a winter specific thing. And so we know that the number of cars that are presumably parking there aren't changing between the seasons. So the only, the only difference really seems to be the snow. And so I wonder if the, you know, sort of coming at this from addressing the parking situation isn't actually addressing the root of the problem because if the snow is still coming out too far and you have to pull, I mean, there have been times we have to pull pretty much out onto Barry Street to be able to see who's coming. Um, I'm certainly not comfortable, you know, telling people who rent who, I mean, I, when I rented a place that didn't have a, an off-street parking place, I made sure that there was sufficient on-street parking and that was, you know, a material piece of moving to a place because if I don't have a place to park, that's not a place that I can live because I have to commute for work. Um, and so I, um, I am not going to vote in favor of this. I, I just, to me, there's got to be a, a, a different approach to take that doesn't, you know, limit the parking given how hard it is to be a tenant in this community in terms of paying your rent and being able to keep ahead or even keep up, frankly. Um, but, and I understand the safety concerns, but I really feel like there's something that we could do with DPW to address that particular spot. And I don't know if there's something separate that we could do for winter to like make sure that people are paying attention, um, but I, I know what that walk is like. And I, even where I live now, sometimes I can't get up the hill in the winter, so I have to park down here, and then I have to walk up the hill to get home. And um, it's, it's, I just, I don't, I'm not sure that, that changing this actually changes the issue. I can answer part of your question, Ashley. One of the reasons it, you know, was not a problem for many years was because the city had a complete parking ban. Mm -hmm. This temper, this, you know, occasional parking ban is relatively new within the city. So these problems have occurred primarily since this partial ban has gone on. Um, 
you know, if, if there's some other way to do it, that's fine. I have empathy for folks who are renting. Um, I have to park sometimes if someone else is in our driveway and I'm going to my mother's house, I have to park up above College Street and walk down because there are renters who prefer to park in front of their building. A lot of times we can't park in front of my mother's building. So we're talking about parking three houses up the street on a street that's basically pretty safe. So I don't think that's too far and there's a lot of parking at the top of that street. So in the interest of safety, and it's only really impacting one house. Everyone else has off-street parking. So if people could park three houses up, unless we can come up with a, another way to deal with it. Yep. So, thank you. Uh, Jack. Um, be, uh, as I read the proposed ordinance, the, uh, the parking ban would only apply to uh, between uh, Barry Street and College Street. And so up where you are, past College Street, you still would have the ability to park during parking ban uh, evenings. Right. And well, not during parking ban evenings, during non-parking ban During non-parking, right. right. <laughs> right. The okay. would be available for parking, and all those houses have other parking, so the street is available mm -hmm. up okay. there. Okay, um, and uh, Donna. Well, is it also, I mean, for me, one of the things besides the snow is just icy. And so you sometimes take up more space to get up the hill. Um, so it is that condition of how much more ice, hot, cold, hot, cold, that we have our winters recently. So I just want to put that in. Um, before, before you go, mm -hmm. um, I want to see if uh, if there's anyone else who hasn't uh, just just conscious of like uh, how many times people are speaking is there, is there anyone else who's um, spoken who would like to speak again okay and any counselors who haven't um, spoken um, yes go ahead but go ahead I, no no no, no. Okay. so um, bringing it back to Prospect Street then I live on Prospect Street I spoke uh, with Stephanie Cohen earlier I don't know if Steven's still here yeah, so I, I, I got uh, some of the same points um, and a couple of uh, expansions on Stephen's points. Um, I also have been hearing from other neighbors on Prospect um, and nearby a couple of possible uh, shifts in the amendment. Um, if it's possible to, to uh, keep the the lower part of Prospect Street open between Northfield Street and College, I'm sorry, and, and School Avenue, um, where it's nice and wide, kind of put between numbers one and two. That feels like it might help uh, those Prospect pe Street people who do need on-street parking. There's also a kind of bulb out underneath number 67 uh, that in past years has been used for, for snow storage, uh, which is a useful use, uh, but if it could be plowed, uh, we could squeeze a couple of cars in there. I think that, uh, I don't know if, if Stephen has a thought on that, but I, I feel like if, if those two areas were uh, also exempted from the ban, um, that would go a long way to, to making it palatable. Um, for, for some folks. I also have heard from uh, neighbors who really do feel like it uh, urgently needs uh, better clearing that the, the complete ban would provide. Uh, it does get frighteningly narrow uh, at some points, and it's already narrow even without snow uh, at a couple of choke points, as Stephen mentioned. So I'd, if we can follow up on that before the second public hearing, at least on those open potential open spots, that'd be great. Could you repeat your numbers again? Yeah, so uh, there's a wide section between, I think it's between numbers one and two Prospect Street. It's like this right is down at the bottom. 35 to 51, right. is it not? But it's that is the, the space on one side of, the, of Prospect Street, that is exempted between yeah. 35 and, and 51. And you're suggesting maybe also exempting? Also exempt between one and two. One and two, okay. And this one little bulb out yep. around number 67. Okay. I wasn't sure if you were exempting yeah. it. 
Yeah. Or wanting to exclude it. So just, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I, I have a, a question too. Um, the, the, as Ashley brought up, you know, the, what's the crux of the issue here? And for me, it's about um, the emergency vehicle uh, passage. And so I will be very interested to hear if with these um, potential changes, you know, if you exempt between one and two, uh, does that jeopardize emergency vehicles um, getting through that space? Yeah, if you, if you, if you have thoughts on that. And, the, and then we'll get to your, your comment, thank you. <clears throat> I think leaving that bottom section open between Northfield and School Ave would not, that's not an issue for emergency vehicles. We have plenty of room there. It's from there beyond, and it gets very tight. Um, there we, I got at least six or eight complaints last year from residents who were concerned, and we would check, and we could not get through with a Keeping in mind that the only access to Prospect Street is on the one end. We can't access it from the other end because we can't make the turn off from Hill Street back. We have done that before. It's not a good option, but you pull up Hill Street and then back down Prospect. Not a great option. But there have been there was a situation where that was our only way in because the street with snow banks gets so narrow. Yeah. And um, I think it was Valerie it made the point when we had a complete parking ban, it's only become a problem since the complete parking ban. So that, that section of Prospect Street needs a complete parking ban. Okay. Um, thank you. And uh, yeah, since this is your second time, yeah, go ahead. Thanks. Yeah, um, yeah I think we've talked about uh, Glenn's point about you know some conciliatory parking either at the bottom of the hill or in the bump out in front of, what number did you say that was? I said 67. Yeah, in front of 67, right. where they've usually banked snow. I think that that's a, it's a reasonable concession. I'd like to see it go the other way. Um, but uh, I'd certainly prefer that over a full ban and people not having access to vehicles on that street at all. Um, Sorry, can you just say that one more time? So yeah. are you, are you saying, well, actually, let me ask a question about what you're saying. Are sure. You, um, you're saying uh, finding a, a closer lot that where you can park all the time in the event of a parking ban? Right. Well, okay. uh, you know, and having having spots in between one and two prospect, if those and, are and that too. Okay. Right. If those are available during mm -hmm. the during the winter, not during the emergency ban. Yep. Okay. Or however, whatever the verbiage is. Yep. Um, yeah. Then that would be that would be, I think, reasonable. Um, uh, to the point about the passage, though, I've, I just haven't seen it, I haven't seen it be, I haven't seen anything be more narrow than where you actually go through the stop sign at Cherry Street. And so I'm curious as to like how, how that's not more of, uh, more of a choke point than anywhere else on the street. Um, and also kind of like Ashley was talking about that it seems like the parking isn't really the issue it's the snow removal. Um, and I see other places, like and maybe Sibley is a good example of this too, where DPW comes in with with a loader and a dump truck, and you know, maybe you have to do one of those every every month, every six weeks if we're getting a lot of snow. I feel like that's almost a, and a, similarly to passage for emergency vehicles, to do that is gonna be, I think, a more thorough solution than to say that people can't park there. Yeah, so one of the, I, so I'm not, yeah. for information, not argument. Sure. But, so the, the point was we always used to do that snow removal yeah. when there was a complete winter ban. You could just go out and do it whenever. Um, and so what, what typically happens is you have the snow event and the crew's out all night doing their thing. And so it isn't always the next night that they can get out and do it. They're exhausted. They're, so it might be a couple nights later. So we call a second ban for snow removal. And the compliance in the second ban is, you know, we'll, we'll end up towing 50, 60 cars, or it might be only three cars during an actual s storm. People just will ignore it. They'll say, well, it's not snowing. I don't need to do it. And so we, so you either end up towing cars or you don't get the snowbank removed. And so then it freezes and it becomes this problem. So if people, if everyone actually complied when, and it's not just these two areas, it's, you know, 
the whole down, you know, it's all over. Sure. Um, and, and so, I, you know, and I think the council's been clear, and I think even staff gets it that, you know, the, the full ban is extremely difficult for, mm -hmm. for people. Um, you know, I don't know what people did up to four years ago, uh, right. what, what folks where you live did all winter or where, where you live. I have no idea how, how they managed that, but that's, that was what we did. And mm -hmm. we had many, many beautiful nights where there was no snow on the ground and no one could park. And that, that prompted the change to try to make it friendlier for people. And I think what you're seeing now is, is residual tweaking of where did we miss? Where could it be fine tuned? And, um, that's why these conversations are helpful. And I think we can, we can go look at these areas between now and the next meeting and see if there's anything. Um, more Ashley, different. and then we'll uh, get to your question. Sure. Um, I just want to make sure that I am correct that the first, in essence, like house and a half of Sibley, if you're headed down the hill before you get to the stop sign, it's like the house and a half before the stop sign has no parking, right? There's like a sign that says no parking here to corner. Is that right? I think. Right. It's so funny. I drive there all the time and I like couldn't. I cannot distinctively remember whether it's there or not, but I'm pretty sure it is. Um, so, and then there are, if, if, so I know that there's three, there's those first three houses. So there's five houses on Sibley total that would be, that would be before College Street that would be impacted. Um, do we know how many uh, units are in those five properties in that area on Sibley? So we, we can. own eight and ten. So there's two. There. So there's there's two units there. And nobody parks. Yeah, there's mm -hmm. two units there. There's I think four next door. So six. Six has at least four, if not. So there's five. five. So that yeah. so that's okay. So there's five units in one building. And I'm not sure how many are in four. Behind the building. Four. I think four has at least four. Yeah. Do you know your? The next door. N number four. Number six, you're in number six? Yeah. And then you said there's five units there? Yeah. So. And then number four has, I think, four, but I'm not sure. Okay, so it's, it's more than, they're more than single family homes or duplexes. Correct. Okay. Um, I just wanted to make sure that my math. I, and where and, do they park when there's a full van? Hmm. Well, I think that's, I mean, but that's a once in a while thing as opposed to, and I, Corner Berry and Granite, there's a gigantic parking space there that all these cars, I mean, I they all mm -hmm. park in there. And I think the I, landlord rented spaces, the landlord for six at one point, I don't know, right. this year rented spaces. I just, that's, that's, that I mean, I know, I know we're talking about this now. I, it, I mean, I, I know renters, like, you know, that's, part of the you know things are going to change in your community I also have a lot of appreciation for the fact that I would have made different decisions if there were no parking because I have to have act I mean I, I used to leave for work at 5 a.m. when I commuted and you know the prospect of walking in the snow you know I had to walk to City Hall a few times and I would have made very different choices and I, I would have been, I would be, if I were in this situation today and, you know, cause sometimes I have to work late and if I get home late and there's no parking there, I mean, that means city hall lot if there's spaces or, you know, trying to find a friend. And I, I wish that we, if we were going to take this up, had taken this up sooner because it feels fundamentally unfair to me that someone enters into a lease agreement, you know, with the understanding that this is this is the situation. We know that it could change, but you are, you know, you're stuck in a lease now. And I, I just, I'm, I'm mindful that, you know, there are those of us that are, that don't have to worry about it for reasons, but then there are some for whom that is a significant impediment to sort of life right now and um, I just I don't know what the solution is to that but it feels really wrong to me to just kind of look at folks who entered into a rental agreement based on a certain understanding and and now that is changing through no fault of theirs and certainly you know the landlord isn't changing that unilaterally um, but that's a I think that's a significant concern Heather, Corey again. 
Um, yes, thank you. It's it's not just one house being affected on Lower Sibley Ave. Um, there are plenty of other renters on that street. Um, I think it's challenging that um, someone that does not live there is speaking um, against letting renters park on the street. Um, I will say there were plenty of parking bans last winter where there was no plowing done on Sibley Ave, and that's a challenge as well. Um, I think it's also unfair that I would need to park further up on Sibley Ave, um, and it's really treacherous right there. There's a house, uh, the yellow house, where the that big massive tree came down, and it is like a sheet of ice at the end of their driveway and down the sidewalk. And I don't think that that's fair that every night of the winter, that's what I'm gonna have to do and you know, risk falling myself and then getting across college and Sibley which is also just a sheet of ice from water cascading down the sidewalk. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, all right, so. Uh, you don't live there. I do, I'm there every so day. So let's we're gonna, not have that argument. Yeah. This um, is a public discussion. All right, so um, uh, we could have a, a move to uh, a motion to Actually, I'm going to close the public hearing. Um, and uh, uh, wondering if there's feedback that you would like to give the um, city manager regarding um, how, if you want to look into anything or ch um, you know make any changes. I mean, we've, we've talked about looking into um, exempting the uh, between one and, and two Prospect Street. Um, is there are any other changes that people are interested in, or um, I mean, uh, I know Ashley, you're objecting to it generally, um, but are there any other thoughts from other folks who haven't said anything yet? Or is there a motion? I have, I have a question. Okay. Yep. Despite my continued opposition, I'm wondering if there is what the city has for parking spaces down that far and the last ones that i can think of are the co-op on stone cutters way but they're the ones right before the co-op parking lot i think the, uh, on the street the public street parking yes and i don't know if those are well those aren't all full band we can look at that i just so if the if this is going to happen and it seems as though there are enough votes for that to happen i just am putting it out there that like it would seem that there may be something that the city could do at least for now so that you know landlords can figure something out and so that it doesn't result in you know forcing the folks who are impacted on the lower end um to like make a significant disruption to wherever it is that they have to park and um, well, actually, to that point, I, I um, was looking at the map of places where people can, bar uh, can park during a parking ban, and I had thought that the spaces uh, on Stonecutter's Way, sort of across from Allen Lumber, mm -hmm. were in the um, spaces where you can always park, but it's not showing up, at least on the map, that Check I on. was able to, to uh, pull up on the city's website, which makes me wonder, like, is that... Is that still I don't know. the case? I, I had remembered that as being a space. Yeah. So if it's um, that, it would be um, good to clear. Uh, I would love to um, if we're going to you know talk about this again. Um, I'd love to clarify that point because that uh, at the very least uh, we could clarify in the city map that that is available if it is, uh, or consider opening that up if it's not. Uh, but um, anyway, uh, other thoughts or comments from the council. I, I might my ask would just be that it be actually like preferential spaces for folks who live in the unit for those that are in those units who have a car right now that does not include off street parking that if there were a way to designate mm -hmm. you know x number of spaces i don't know night, if you have any mechanism but, for doing that um but in any case jack i think people have made some uh, valid concerns that i hope we can 
discuss more, but for now I move that we schedule a second public hearing on this proposed ordinance. And based on the timing, I assume it would be next week, which isn't very much time, but I know that there are also concerns with uh, getting the notice out to people so it can be effective. So my motion would be that the second public hearing would be uh, next week. Well, it could be. I mean, you could do it in January. Um, it just be wouldn't be a month of the big middle of winter where it wasn't resolved. But so, sorry, your motion is to have Take it be a day the next check. meeting <laughs> on the 18th, Jan on December 18th. Okay. Yes. I'll second, second it. Okay. Um, any further discussion? Um, okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Okay. Um, thank you all for your. Um, very thoughtful comments, and uh, we'll maybe see you back next week, potentially. And we will, um, council knows this, but you folks wouldn't, as our staff team meets every Thursday morning after these meetings and debriefs what happened, so we will, and the chief, police and fire chief are here, so we will spend some time seeing what what we can come up with, because it certainly makes, you know, I get the situation. Yes. And it, right now, it's just, they just voted it'll be next Wednesday. Okay, so. okay. Uh, yes, Don. There was also a statement from this gentleman, I thought, he was asking not to do the snow storage at number right, six, gonna, 67. All of that. Is yeah. that included? Yeah. I didn't okay. mean to, I was looking at Ms. Corey, but yeah. I meant all the comments that were raised will have to go in and okay. Good. evaluate. Okay. Um, yes. Just a clarification, so you, you want to add uh, the no part, uh, where to go, uh, but I'm, I'm, we'll just take a look at the options. Yeah, I'm interested in that, but um, <coughs> if that's not an option, that's okay. Right. But let's look Done. at it. So. Yeah. Okay, great. All right, thank you all. Thank you. Yep. Um, yes, well, let's take uh, a little break, and, and then we'll go into the budget. Okay. Our last... Uh, Regular item is uh, the budget, so I'm going to actually I'm going to move right there. There you go. And uh, take it away. Thanks. Um, first of all, I would like to start by uh, apologizing that we don't have more detail for you. Um, as you have been told in advance, the uh, the budget this year was particularly challenging, and we really were working on numbers. Um, I was actually, you know, home working on them last night. We were tweaking some today. We met this afternoon on our capital and equipment plan um, to try to get that straightened out. So this is really rolling out. We, but where we're at, we feel like uh, we're pretty comfortable proposing. My original plan for tonight had been to um, share our tale of woe with you. And when we first, when we first laid out the budget, we we had a very large increase, as, as most of you know. And I think for, for the folks that are watching, the biggest uh, uh, challenge we had this year was our health and our, and our workers' comp insurance, which really was about a three and a half, you know, that comprised about three and a half percent increase in the budget just on its own. And so we first looked at trying to do everything that we could, that we wanted to do, that you wanted to do, and maintain our services and, and at least keep things level where they were. We were up in a five and a half to six percent tax increase, which I think most of us felt were was not going to fly here. Uh, and then we took a look at how to get it at least to about last year. We had a four cent increase, about three point seven percent tax increase. So how do we get it back into that area? And that was pretty scary in terms of meeting our goals. And then we said, well, you know, inflation is running about two, I think, in fact, it came out today, it's 2.1%, but I think it was like 1.9%, but it was about 2%. So what does it look like if we get it to 2%? And that was, you know, a, a major change in how we did that. So my plan tonight was to come and sort of lay out these range of things and say, give us some direction, you know, what, what do you want? But instead, uh, we we tweaked and we worked and we um, came up, as I said, really this is sort of hot off the press. Um, so I'm just going to give you an outline tonight and tell you where we're at. We'll have your budget books for you hopefully by the end of the week, uh, certainly by Monday, plenty in advance of next week's meeting so you can look at all the detail. 
um, but I think I can hit the high notes. But to, to cut to the chase, which is actually in the last slide, uh, we're at a at a budget uh, at a tax percent increase of about 3.6 percent, which is really 100 percent due to uh, the, the insurance increases. So basically, holding the line on everything else, and the tax rate I think is around four or 4.1 cents. Uh, so that's that's where we're at, and it includes most of what you want, not everything. Um, so I'll just walk down through it. I don't know if we need to turn the lights out. Can everybody see this yeah. fine? You want them out? I no. She it's, doesn't. I don't. You don't? No. I would like them on. Scared of the dark? No, I'm not afraid of the dark anymore. My <laughs> monsters are real, but um, <laughs> no, it's just it's hard like no, for my fine. eyes to no, adjust. I'm just <laughs> so basically, um, you know, a lot of this is just the, the the dog and pony show, but it's the FY21 budget. Obviously, our goal is to in, increase implement the strategic plan. Uh, we've we've had a, a commitment about our capital and equipment funding plan, and as some of you may remember, that last year we we originally planned to increase it fifty thousand last year, and then we compromised that we would do twenty five last year and another twenty five this year. So our goal was to honor that commitment, deliver our responsible services, and uh, again this year our major challenge was the insurance costs. Just a reminder, I mean, I, this is hard to read, but just we do have a strategic plan. We do have key areas and different strategies. We're going to go into that in a little bit more detail. Uh, so when we look at what we've got in the budget under our community prosperity, we've maintained the $100,000 in funding for the de Montpelier Development Plan. We've, uh, I actually meant to update that from last year, that second bullet, but uh, we have not touched our planning and zoning staff, so we have new zoning. We're working on a master plan and we're implementing the TIF district. Uh, hopefully we'll have some projects this year that uh, we can bring forward later in the year. Um, under environmental stewardship, we've continued uh, the $5,000 from MEAC. We have uh, the stormwater projects in our capital plan. Um, we have the GMT circulator bus included, although that may well turn into being um, the on-demand transit funding. I think they're counting on that. So we left the funding in so we would have that ability to talk about it. We do need to talk about the energy planning grant. We did not get it. Um, and uh, as of today, we didn't have the funding included in the budget. We think we may have found a place for it in the capital plan to fund some or all of it. So that's a, a little bit of a question mark. We'll know more about that certainly by next week. Uh, our inclusive, equity, uh, equ equitable, and welcoming community. We have um, the community fund is funded actually at a slight increase, three or four thousand that they had requested. We have the ten thousand that you've already in, uh, included for the social equity contract, uh, and we funded again Feast, Montpelier Alive, and our community enhancements. Sustainable infrastructure. We've uh, we do have the additional twenty five thousand dollars for CIP uh, in there. The water and sewer plan is, continues to be followed. You may recall we had a presentation about um, needs of DPW. So we had a retiree, a supervisor retiring, and the plan is to convert that to a line staff to have an extra plow person. And we also have a contract right now, a private contract for um, collecting trash in the downtown. And the, the plan, the proposal right now is to convert that to another uh, full-time position, have DPW assume the the trash pickup work and downtown cleanup, but that would free up another extra person for plowing in the winter. Uh, so that was a there was a slight increase over the contract price, but we felt that it it was worth it uh, to try to deal with the, the snow plowing issues. Thoughtfully planned uh, built environment. We've Again, have the downtown improvement district funding. Uh, we have our funding for downtown projects in the capital plan, and we re we kept the twenty thousand for public art. Uh, we had the presentation tonight. I think they thought it was twenty five thousand, but it was twenty, and we've retained that in in this year's budget. Uh, for more housing, again, last year we funded one hundred and ten thousand. Uh, I know it wasn't as much as what people had hoped, but it had been a significant increase, and we've kept that in the budget for this year. Uh, and we, again, have our TIF, TIF program, which we hope will lead to some additional housing. Public health and safety, we have our share of a social worker to be 
uh, partly grant funded and partly shared with the city of Barrie for the public police department. Again, we've uh, tried to anticipate public events. We've continued our paramedic program, which means uh, you know we're getting more people certified in the paramedic program each year. As we hire new firefighters, we are seeking to replace firefighters with paramedics. So we're trying to s incrementally grow the program, and that includes um, it, it, it's great because it, not only does it provide additional service, um, but we can charge higher ambulance bills, which are insurance covered because we're providing a higher level of service. We can bring in more revenue, but there's also much more costly equipment and the, the drugs that are used and those sorts of things. So it's um, so that's taken again for we're continuing um, Project Safe Catch. Responsive and responsible government. We are continuing communications efforts and actually hoping we can ramp some up, but there's no specific funding. Our employee wellness remains funded and basically keeping the same service levels, including the um, good old faithful bridge article. Okay, Tom, you have any good with that? I'm in no position. <laughs> 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 so in the strategic plan, we had some specific budget items. You may recall there were certain things we talked about. And in fact, if you look at the, the list we put on your desk every week, which has the upcoming meeting, there's been this list all year of you know items to talk about at budget time. So I felt that we should probably talk about those. The, the current, uh, so the first one on the list, at least as the order I wrote them down, is to upgrade the street lights to LED. Uh, the, the, right now we have a chance to buy the lights and ballasts for a really good price uh, from Efficiency Vermont, so we're planning to do that. We can't really do the full uh, change out without redoing all our wiring, uh, so that we're looking, uh, we're still costing that out and looking at options and doing cost benefit, but we're eyeing a possible $140,000 bond vote or we're trying to figure out the best way to structure this, but it might be in November. So there's no money for that part of it yet, um, but definitely on the front burner. CSO projects, we're following our plan. There are some in the capital plan, the highest priorities. The equity consultant is in the budget. Interesting that we had actually identified that in last year's strategic plan as a need and then came up and uh, you funded it. So. Good for you. Uh, <laughs> the downtown master plan is being completed. There is funding um, in, in the capital plan for coordinated signals, one of the first items of that. Um, so as the plan gets completed and we start looking at really restructuring intersections and those kind of things. But one of the things that happens to happen is those high tech signals that all talk to each other. And so I think we have $25,000 for those signal upgrades. Emergency management, we did up increase funding this year just to uh, reflect costs that we've actually had. It's not a drastic increase, but it is an increase. Alternative fuel, um, the plan is to purchase alternative fuel when it's available, and we do have a police hybrid. That's actually in this current year. It's not in next year's budget, although our plan would be to order. We, have, we replace a cruiser every year, so we would uh, ideally have a hybrid next year as well. Uh, assuming this one works. It's huge delay right now. Um, Chief could explain it better than I, but there's a, kind of a shortage in cruisers right now. Some of the companies are getting out of the market, and so your choices of sizes and options and things, and uh, we've, we've had this car in order for a long time, hasn't shown up yet. So, um, you know, it used to be they were more city end type things, and now people have gone to the more four-wheel drive and the, those things. and. Chevy's pretty much gotten out of the market, and they used to be the market. So it's it's just one of the you know hmm. that's the way it is. Uh, parking garage operations. Obviously, we've just deferred that until we actually know when it's going to be open and functioning. So we didn't spend a lot of time on that. Housing trust fund. We maintained funding for that. Infrastructure. We increased the twenty five thousand. Personnel plans, we haven't completed that, but uh, we do have updated personnel costs in the budget, and we've tried to anticipate some of the changes that are likely to occur. As I mentioned, the social worker would, and again, these are all things we'd called out last spring. Uh, the city shares in the budget. Public Wi-Fi was on the list. We took a look at that. It's gonna cost sixty to $90,000 for installation plus some annual costs. Um, so we didn't take that much further. You know, obviously, if the council wants to pursue that, we can, but it's not included in the budget simply due to cost and what our staff at least believed were the priorities. So recreation center, you've seen the presentation. Um, 
decision is pending from you folks about that. Probably something we'll talk about next week. We'll be getting the updated numbers. You know, it's going to be ballpark six million dollar bond. I think that the key there is that would be a three hundred thousand dollar bond payment the first year, first full year. And, and one way to look at it is that typically we we put those into the capital plan, so they they fall within the total capital funding. So in that regard, it's good. Taxes don't necessarily go up. The bad news is that's three hundred thousand less to, that we have to spend on other projects. So or we could choose to increase the capital plan to help pay for this. So I think that's a policy decision. Confluence Park, uh, we have approved a design, uh, and we don't have any real hard numbers yet, so there's no thing. And Saban's Pasture, there's no, also no firm plan in place. You know, who knows, maybe if some of those come to fruition, if we have to have a vote in November, some of those could be packaged up then, possibly TIF projects or those kinds of things. So those were the, the list of budget items in the strategic plan. What's not included, although I, I, I may be going back on this right, is the energy plan, which uh, was a $35,000 cost. We, I may have different news about that um, next week. I don't know. Um, but right now, in my head, it's not included. Uh, the Homelessness Task Force, I just heard today, might be asking for as much as $57,000. Uh, I think it's broken out into s discrete asks but total together so that's on the list there's nothing in there uh, and not even the 10,000 for the shelters right now Ashbor funds last year we funded um, positions and then we had also done a, a $20,000 allocation I think there was some thought that that allocation was intended to be carried forward every year uh, wasn't the understanding of that at least the finance director and I had. They, they've only spent four thousand. There's sixteen thousand dollars left. Um, so there are there's ten thousand dollars for the medications or whatever the, the, the inoculations. So it's not in there. Biannual like citizen survey. We were going to include it this year. Um, we haven't done the one this current year that we had said we were going to do out of reserve, uh, and we were going to then put five thousand a year away to do them every three years but didn't make the cut. Again, the public Wi-Fi, uh, not in there. The LED street lights I already talked about, rec building, Confluence Park, and Sabin. So those are items to be considered. Um, so all that taken, I already mentioned that. Uh, the projected property tax rate would be a 3.6% increase, uh, 4.1 cents. This is, all, I think last year was four, I think that's almost exact as last year. It might have been 3.7 cents last year. Um, but right around that same, excuse me, 3.7% last year. Uh, the average tax bill would be increased $93 for this. And again, really that's all, uh, that is the hit from the health insurance. Everything else is kept even for everything else. And then our other rates are as simply as planned, district heat, water, sewer, all those kind of things. So those are the main municipal rates. This is our schedule next week. We'll have our first real in-depth budget workshop. Staff will be here. You'll have had a chance to see detail and those kinds of things. And then we're doing that again on the 8th. Uh, and then the 15th is our first public hearing on the budget and the warning ballot articles and all those kind of things. And then on Thursday night, January 23, we all remember it. it's a th always a Thursday night, the last one, because why? Come on, here's a quiz. Who remembers why? Has John? to be so many days. That's it. Petition deadline. Yes. Yeah, so that's the deadline for petitions. So we can, if we have it on Wednesday, then we might have to come back to accept petitions on Thursday. So we've just decided to do it all in one night. So that is the 40-day prior to the vote uh, deadline day for finalizing any ballot items, petitions, anything else. And then March 3rd is the voting. And then early voting to start in February. So that's our schedule. I'm happy to answer any questions to the extent that I can. Like I said, I don't have huge detail in front of me, nor do you, but I'm happy to answer at least any big picture questions uh, as I am able. Uh, Donna and then Jack, do you have something? I don't know if they're big enough questions. Uh, um, but when you were going along, it's like when you talked about the lights. Mm -hmm. Is are we going to see like a map? I mean, we've had a, I've had a lot of constituent complaints, particularly on out or on State Street and some other downtown locations about the lights not being strong enough, focused enough. So if we're going to do this, are we <coughs> going to also consider meeting that demand that we're hearing? Correct. So the 
I mean, obviously, we would show you. I mean, for us to cost this out appropriately, we need to know what lights and what the cost is. So some of this, you know, with LED lighting, you save quite a bit on electricity and the lease costs, but there's an upfront cost. So we've got to calculate the payback, but also there is an improvement in light quality. At least some people think so. Not everyone likes LED lighting, but um, we seem to think, it, you know, the, the, the ones that we have tried as trials seem to work fine and provide sufficient light. So, so since we're doing the wiring, we can do some replacement of lights? The, it would be taking the downtown core lights and changing them all to LED. It would be a pretty substantial project. It okay. wouldn't be just changing a couple lights. And, okay. and then, then my other question on the same slide was about, you said, you talked about the coordinated signals. Does that include a brand new one at Barry Street in Maine? I don't know. Or the just the existing that. ones I, being I, changed? I don't know. Okay. I mean, we, like I said, we literally yep. put those capital numbers yep. together. But but we'll take a note of the questions and make sure we get back to you. Um, okay. So we have Jack, then Ashley, and then Connor. And what was that a hand? Okay. This is, Bill, this is uh, pretty encouraging and it looks better than uh, <laughs> I, I had feared. So I. Uh, Us too. I say. <laughs> Scare us every year now. No. <laughs> <laughs> add a boy and add a girl to the team for that. Yeah. Um, well, we our team did a lot of hard work, and Todd Proventure decided to go out with a bang. Really. <laughs> uh, Thank you, Todd. Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yay, Todd. Here, yep. Um, I'm. I'm wondering about uh, the experience we had last year with. Uh, with public works and the, and the water main breaks, and um, ha, do we have all our expenses in, including any kind of uh, contracted work that we might have had done for things that weren't able to be done in house? And how do we feel about what we're putting in for this? Sure. Year? So all of those um, those are all in the water fund. This is generally the general fund that we're talking about here. That, so those are funded particularly by water rates. Uh, we are feeling the, the water budget is sufficient to cover those. And again, with the, you know we have a 50-year plan um, to deal with those. So every year it's replacing, either replacing or putting in reserve funds to replace lines. Uh, sometimes it's more efficient to wait and do a, a bigger chunk. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the, the approved plan was to basically take uh, cost of living plus an additional percent each year on the rate so that we could we could be building up um, sufficient funds. So all of that water repair work and sewer repair work, which is in the sewer fund, are um, are addressed through that. Thanks. We do have we do have a a, a water and sewer benefit fund, the the two cents that we put on, uh, and that can be allocated between the two. And I think. We may be looking at reallocating that just to make sure it's put in the right place, but it's no impact to the rate payer. Is, is that the uh, sewer benefit, the, the fund that's paid by people like me who uh, pay a charge, but uh, we have a septic tank and yes. so we just get pumped? Yes. Um, Ashley. Um, the social worker, the shared social worker, has the city of Barrie put that in their proposed budget? We understand they are going to. That was the communicate. Obviously, it doesn't work if either right. community doesn't do it. So obviously, if they don't, then then we can reduce that out of our budget. But the we understand there's going to be a fairly significant ask for police services in Barrie. So this would be a minor part of it. I was going to say I think it was six, six officers. Four, I believe. Four? Um, no, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the other, I just want to be mindful uh, working in. The social services profession that thirty-two thousand dollars a year is not. A huge no, it it that's also to match grant funds from the state. Oh, so it's sixty-four. It's some larger number. I don't know okay. what the percentage is. But I was the, like but the two oh. cities are the, the thirty-two local shares, the Barry Montpelier share, and then we're splitting that. Um, and then there's another. Tony, uh, Tony's looks like Tony has something to say about this. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. The way, so first of all, I'll answer your question. The last word I had from Chief Bombardier was there's a placeholder, you know, it's up to twenty thousand dollars. Okay. Last he know, knows, it's, at least it's still there, because absolutely uh, it needs both communities. The employee would be a Washington County mental health clinician, and and the so the ask, the primary ask, and what we're hoping for through the legislature, uh, through appropriations, is the other funding from that. So it wouldn't actually. I thought we already got that. 
No, not yet. And then, but in addition to that, for long-term sustainability, we've also are working with, um, in particular, uh, we reached out to Eric Miller from some uh, from UVM um, Medical Center because we also think that they should be, you know, and they want to be a, a partner as well as we provide as a community better care for these people. So that's kind of the the makeup. Uh, provide all this comes true. The concern is any one leg of the stool, uh, the whole thing does not happen. So. Um, cool. Thank you. And then my endless, shameless um, plug about a 25% increase to health care. I accept that there, that it is what it is. It is just unacceptable to me that health insurance companies can literally like hold people hostage. So I, I, I do appreciate that. And I, I would, you know, my personal opinion is that the health insurance system in the country probably could change. That's obviously, as a professional, I have no opinion on it. <laughs> um, but that said, last year we had almost no increase, uh, and which is one of the reasons why we were able to do what we did in the budget and, and get a lot of this stuff in. Now, I'm not saying 25% is great or anything else, but you know, over a two-year period, I think there were series, certainly years when we would get 12 or 13% each year, and it's crazy. Um, the, the, the struggle we have, and I think we have to understand this, and, and I'm not trying to paint insurance companies as good or bad people, but we have a small pool of 110 employees, of which only I think 70 or 80 are actually in insured. Other people take the buyout. So we, we have a very small insurance pool. And so they collect, you know, whatever. I, I'm going to make these numbers up a little bit, but uh, $2 million, let's say, or more. $3 million from the city in in premiums. And last year we had claims of four or five million dollars. So people are human and get No, that's right. <laughs> and that's what insurance is for. I get that. But if 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 you're looking at this, you know, if you're not covering those claims, you've got to get the money back somehow. I mean they paid them, don't get me wrong, you know, the insurance claims are paid. So they were you know, they look at our experience. So and and this is what insurance markets do, right? You get a you get an automobile accident, your insurance goes up because they had to pay out a claim, and so this is this is um, the way it goes. I think what we've really and we looked at every possible option. I'm sure Todd would be happy to explain to you all the different uh, angles we looked at, and at the end concluded that none were better than for for the short run for, than what we're doing now. I think we've got to figure out a way to get to a larger pool. My my frustration was definitely not with any of the work yeah. that the city has done. I am yeah. just I I really well see, but I think that to me saying that we can't do anything is, and I understand like the size of Montpelier versus like the insurance industry. I I understand all of those sort of practical pragmatic things, but as someone who has been incredibly sick and could have died recently, you know the fact that we as a community have to accept a 25% increase to offer our employees the care and coverage that we believe is adequate is unconscionable. I mean, in what universe do I go in and ask for a raise at 25% and be like, I'm getting it? Like, that that's not real life. Like, that's not how the world works. And I know that insurance companies have the power well, and authority to do this because well, they're huge, but. And it's, a, and it's a marketplace, so you know we could have opted not to take it but we couldn't find any uh, any sufficient substitute. But I, I think, though, that... So our choice was to not insure employees. And I'm, I'm not saying that, but what I am saying is that this is an opportunity for Montpelier to, like, make a point to mm -hmm. two other areas that a 25% increase... I mean, so if it's 25% this year, and then next year it's the 12 to 13%, I mean, at some point, like, it just becomes an option that is not sustainable. Well, I, I, you know, I'd agree with that, and I'd simply say we've had this conversation many, 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 many times. I'm just times loud. I'm getting this, loud for Blue Cross because I'm done. This, well, I don't think it's well, just, you know, I, I have been paying, this time of year I pay attention to what other communities and school districts and others, and I'm, you know, I hear budgets that are coming out, and across the board I'm either reading or hearing about, well, they had this huge in insurance in increase. So it, it's, it's a real problem. I mean, we're hoping maybe we can get it to the state pool, but even then, you know, you're still at the mercy of, you know they're insured through Blue Cross, so. I think that's yeah. that. It's my my disagreement is more of a policy issue than in, in terms of any sort of city anything. I mean, I know that we offer solid health insurance, and I have no interest in changing that. But 
I really encourage people. I mean, if if the ask if if insurance companies can keep doing this, this ask is going to keep coming. And at some point, it is not going to be something that people who like who want to live here can continue to afford in tax increases, whether it's property taxes or rent. And well, that's all I'm saying. Thank you, uh, Connor. Just questions or ideas as well? Oh, anything. Yeah, sure. anything is fine. Okay. Open uh, discussion. Yeah, the same as the social worker one, has Ashley got that answered? Uh, might be unpopular. How much do we spend on the strategic planning retreat at the beginning of the year for the council? I want to say around 10000 Okay. Um, Don't have that in the budget this year. Oh, really? We, we didn't last year. We took out a fund balance. But actually, we have a new uh, assistant city manager who's a strategic planning person, so I was thinking of having her lead it this year. See how that goes. Cool. That's Trial great. by fire. Okay. Have we done, like, an analysis? I know we contract out for legal services, and I see a lot of municipalities have in-house city attorneys. Have we ever done, like, a just cost analysis to see if we'd actually save money by bringing that in-house? We have looked at that. Um, and you know, this last year we've had a really high amount of legal fees. Um, the the issue that we have is so I, I you know the only one I really know of, well Burlington I think has been South Burlington the only ones I really know that have in-house attorneys Burlington South Burlington has two, uh, and I've talked to them about that. But then they still contract out for other issues. So one of the issues we have is that you know there's sort of general legal work contracts, easements, <coughs> you know, the kind of, those sorts of things, like general, you know, do we have the authority to do X? You know, I call it general municipal law type thing. But then we have, you know, it's more specialized zoning, land use, Act 250 stuff. We have personnel, labor law. Um, we have, uh, you know, any number of environmental law. So depending on the topic, depending on the topic, you know, we're using different attorneys or different firms for different things. So, you know, could we get an, a person for the price we're paying? Maybe. Are they specialized? You know, do they have the ability to handle all the different issues? I don't, I don't know. So I think that so far we've concluded, you know, I don't think it's been enough. And like I said, I talked to South Burlington and they said even with two full time, they're still contracting out specialized work you know, on top of that. So, I, you know, I haven't seen it that it made sense for us to do that. And last, at some point, I'd like to propose that we have up to a $10,000 contract with a lobbying firm because we have so many moving pieces at the State House right now. In the social worker <coughs> position, we got microtransit, we got rail, we got a ton of things in the appropriations bill that I think it makes sense and would actually be an investment to bring down state funds in some of these areas if we had some something limited in scope where somebody was in the building watching, said, hey, Chief Pecos, we need you up in government operations like Tuesday at 10, you know? So just consideration with the council. Cool. Thanks. Uh, Lauren. Um, I was just thinking about the um, DPW. And so you have a supervisor converted to line staff. And because a supervisor is leaving, so replacing that with a line staff. And the conversion of the contract into which I appreciate. I'm really glad to see some work being done trying to address some of the staffing challenges that um, DPW has been facing. Could you describe how the, so with with a, one fewer supervisor, like what, can you just describe what the structure of the department would be and knowing that Donna was kind of taking on two roles, does that all fall onto her then? And right. Is that so part of that had to do with the restructuring that we, we did. Um, there is, so the supervisor, Brian Tuttle, who's retiring, has been the, the superintendent, we call it, and so oversees the water, sewer, and street crews. And then there's another supervisor that oversees all of our equipment, mechanics, those kinds of things, and then supervisors at the water plant and the, the wastewater plant. But the, the street crew, ha crew has a foreman, the water, uh, water and sewer crew has a foreman, and they're very capable. So we're not sure they need the, the direct you know, somebody over them. Uh, when when we brought Donna in, we also restructured underneath so that we we have uh, sort of Kurt, who is really oversees all of our water and sewer operations, including the plants, and then Zach is taking a higher look over the, the other operations as well as doing some engineering. So we felt that between having Zach, and, and Tom is still here. Tom's 
now stationed at the garage, even though he's a project, he's going to be he's in the budget as a part time project manager. But still, we have eyes on the ground in the garage. So we felt that the the the, the guys that are doing the the foreman, the oversight work, are actually handling the day to day work, and they need they need boots on the ground more than they need a, a, a supervisor. They're capable of doing it, and we've got sufficient staff to handle that. Um, all right, so I have a few questions. Um, I um, made a couple notes as we were just going through these um, um, slides. Uh, so early on under the one that was community prosperity, it says implement TIF district, but there's not really anything to implement. No, at this well, I point. mean, the, so the TIF. So first of all, in all candor, that was left over from last year. Oh, okay. I forgot to take it out. Yeah, yeah. So there's that. That's, fine. Um, um, that's the truthful answer. Uh, but we do have. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. We do have, um, we do have the TIF district, and we are actively in discussions with potential projects. So, uh, along with MDC and others. So uh, even though there's nothing right now to to show to talk about, you know, it's possible, and and that we could be coming forward in that would normally be another TIF bond to front the infrastructure to get back through the, mm -hmm. the TIF fund. So it is happening and we also have a fair, you know, we have to keep track of all the increases in value. So there, there's ongoing work with TIF even if we're not okay. doing. Fair enough. Um, under the next one, environmental stewardship, um, uh, stormwater projects is listed. I have faith that they are happening and continuing to be done. I'm just going to reiterate that I would love to, I, I, this is something that we've talked about before, but I would just love to have a, um, a list of things from the stormwater master plan that have been checked off. And, um, to and I believe that's in progress. Okay, great. It's been and, asked for. Okay, and then uh, that also uh, related to that um, with uh, the no change required for the sewer benefit and the CSO benefit. Um, it's just reminding me that we were um, perhaps going to have a conversation about the financing for um, stormwater plans and just recognizing that time is getting short for this council uh, and so uh, just trying to, is that what is meant by, um, uh, I'm trying to, I don't think it's on this list. Yeah, well, it's probably shorthand. <laughs> it could be. I mean, it could be the hazard mitigation. No, that's, that's something that's completely something else. different. Yeah. Um, so just want to put it out there that I would still love to have that conversation, if at all possible. About stormwater? About uh, a utility? The utility, right. Yes. It, should we be exploring so I believe I utility? believe that is on the front burner. Okay. You know, we, uh, not to make excuses, but no, we've no, had a big change at the top yeah, at, at DPW, yeah, fair, and fair. we're having a change in finance and those are both very key positions and so I think managing those transitions is probably taking higher priority than this at this time but definitely a utility is something that we're okay uh, on I just radar. want to make sure that I'm at least mentioning it because it is still uh, uh, of interest and yep. not to say that like we have to do that I just want to mention that it's uh, an option I think is still worth uh, exploring um, other there was one, a couple other things. Um, one possibility um, uh, for the LED streetlights um, is what if that what if that was its own separate bond? Um, that I, I don't know how the council would feel about that necessarily. That's, so that is what we're envisioning. Oh, you are. Okay. Um, we but we're just not quite ready to. I think if we're going to do a bond for LEDs, we should be in a position to give real clear information about the payback mm -hmm. yes. and the work involved and, the, you know, and really do a good presentation on it. Mm -hmm. um, so the staff is suggesting that might be a November bond. Oh, it's, for, so depending okay. on what we choose to do with the rec center and if we have TIF bonds, mm -hmm. you know, we're going to, you know, and it'll be a slow election in November anyway, so there won't be much happening for the <laughs> clerk. So, uh, fair. Fair. So, uh, well, okay, fair enough. I'm glad that that's a yeah. part of that discussion because especially is something that theoretically ought to be saving us um, right. money than that putting it uh, to I mind. think rather than just say we think it's going to save us money, we'd rather be able to right, and be able say to show it. Um, and in addition, I appreciate Donna, um, you know, bringing up, uh, you know, should we be adjusting any um, lighting along with that plan? And I know we had um, yeah. also, just want to bring up uh, for the sake of the council as well, I had some 
uh, comments about the lack of a street light where the new bike path extension crosses Berry Street, um, and that would be a great uh, sort of obvious place to to do to have an additional street light, and I, I could picture that easily also being right. built into that um, if it were a bond or whatever that cost is. So that's um, that's great, and I think those are my only comments for now. I will have a question for the council about uh, if if we decide to go in the direction of a, a rec building bond, if we want to have any extra um, meetings for the public about that, uh, particularly calling that out and, and discussing it, but we don't have to jump to that for now. Um, one thing that I think would be useful, unless you're, but there's anything else, um, one thing that I think might be useful for this discussion uh, is um, I'd love to hear from people about uh, how they're feeling about this uh, proposed budget plan. Are there items that are in it that you think should not be? Are there so things? To oh, that point, oh, actually, sorry, you just ahead. reminded me, you will be getting um, by email probably tomorrow. This is the, some of you may remember this worksheet from last year. So this has been updated. This is the thing where you can just click these X's on the left and put items either in or out of the budget, and oh, you get good. to see the tax increase. Yes, yes. In, and um, we're just, we've got to, like, again, this is, we're really, this stuff is just rolling out uh, today even. So you can see some of the things on the bottom, the items, <coughs> and, and we're just going to make it a little more user friendly as far as if you want to change the amounts. But this is, you know, almost done, as you can see. And we will have this to you to play with in advance uh, this week. And it will be, we'll, like we did last year, we'll have it live on the screen as we talk through it. You'll get your books with all the detail and what, the summary of all this. It'll, obviously, it'll be what you've just heard, but it'll be something that you can actually look at. Would it be possible to, I, I know this would be an easy thing to send out via email yeah. to all of us, but uh, also hoping that we can uh, potentially add this as a file to the website. So I that think we did that last did year. Did you do that? Okay, so, yeah. so that people could, yeah. um, you know, the public can do also the same uh, it, yeah. process, go through yeah. the same exercise. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Um, okay, it looks like there's some comments. I'm happy to pause. Well, finish. Finish. Uh, well so uh, based on, you know, that we're, we're going to get this soon, um, one possibility is if, if people want to make a pitch for um, anything um, extra or uh, put on the list? Know, yeah, or or something that um, you know we should take out. Wh whatever it is, um, that seems like that'd be probably an appropriate thing to do at this point, and then we'll get into playing. Unless unless people want to take the time to to do this right now. Go through this. Go through this. Yeah, I think we should we should each have some time with this document. To uh, to see how it looks if we add or subtract things or whatever. Um, are there some lines? Yeah. Are there some lines that function that have nothing in it that we could put something in it? I mean, as a formulas work. I think I'm, so. I'll, I'll do you know what I mean? Yes. If I wanted, like, like, if you like, want to yeah. add something down at the bottom, like well, here. Well, she talked about say, adding stuff, but right. Unless, so we could have like Donna's, and then if he, and you wanted um, ten thousand. And then you put an X. So I'm doing this live. I have no idea what's going to happen here. So yeah, sure enough. Okay, cool. So, so then you can. Add. So we can add things that aren't there. Right. Okay. Great. It's just got to remember to That's check it on the side. That the X is the key. That's what triggers. So. Um, I know. What, uh, and it's same thing with here. If you want to cut something, you take it out. And if so. Yeah. Um, I know, Connor, you made a pitch for something, and if, if, any, if anyone else wants to um, advocate for oh, something, it would be great. Um, but go ahead, Donna. Uh, well, I d how do we know what you already have? Like, okay, my concern is parks. Yeah. We did this thing of funding a full person, but we wouldn't let them start for a full year, and we said we were going to then put in a person to follow up yeah, with that, Phil that's, Alex. Yeah, those are, those are funded. Okay, so how, how you'll, we, we, you'll get that detail. Okay. So that's okay. All right. Great. Um, things that were sort of operational that you had approved last year that were going along. Those are, you know, we we would have flagged those if something had changed, if we had not funded or continued that. But the idea was this is 
anything that's kind of an add-on or something unusual is on these lists, like the social worker or calling out that we changed DPW a little bit. Otherwise, the assumption is it's, it's what we've, same level that we've been at. Uh, but when you get the actual book and my written summary, that'll call that out in more detail. But that's a good question. Um, just in terms of the things not included, it sounds like maybe there's some work being done on the energy plan, but that definitely is a big priority. And if we're going to hit 2030, if we don't start doing a real plan now, there's no way we're going to do it. So that would be something I want to look at what our options are. And I mean, maybe right. there are possible other <coughs> grants or things right. that we could explore, right. but would love to keep a focus on trying to get that funded. Well, one and that's one of the reasons why we put it on the list is, you know, we just found out about the, the grant yeah. funding pretty close to the budget time. We it was, The grant would have been for 22000 and we would have had to make up the difference, which we had planned to do in the current fiscal year. Uh, so I put it on this list of unfunded, and literally today we were, uh, which is why I'm, I'm hedging a little bit on this, but as we were doing the capital plan, we had, we have some money in the capital plan, which, you know, may or may not be the right place for this, but times are tough, right? So, um, for energy projects, you know, to actually do energy efficiency projects, and we had some identified, and there was like 34,000 left, and I was like, well, that's about the plan. So we were gonna just tweak some numbers and see if we could come in and just say, how about we just pay for that out of, the, you know, it's one-time money, and just pay for it out of the capital plan and get it done, and then if we can find grants to offset it, then we can free that money up for other things, so. Is, is a, a person wiser than me this week called the, the budget a shell game anyway. And, uh, <laughs> 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 that would have been. Um, go ahead, Lauren. Um, and I guess just, you know, so I don't know what, what all will be in the homelessness task force request. I mean, that to me is an example where advocacy at the state house for the kinds of funding that I think should be really looked at and what can we bring to the city and what pots of money are there. Um, it, it does take a lot of work, so um, I think trying to compile that list of um, state funding, I mean, the advocacy we might want around um, trying to get in the state pool, I think there, there is a whole suite of things that we could look at where could, where could we be looking for um, increased state funding or ensuring that Montpelier would be on a list to get um, certain programs and other things, and then where, how does that fit into um, our city budget? Right, um, and yeah, and again, I think the, I, I can't speak particularly knowledgeably, but I understand that the uh, the task force asks, or you know, so like ten thousand dollars for the, the shelter expansion, some money for lockers, some money for bathrooms. You know, there's the specific items um, so that when total together, so obviously the council could say, well, you know, we can do some, but not all. But yeah, but I, I, I agree. I mean, I think, you know editorializing a little bit, you know, we're in this position because the other levels of government that are supposed to be handling this stuff aren't. And it's falling to, uh, you know, whether it's health insurance or homelessness services or social equity or any of these things, it's dumping on us because there's no place else to go. Um, Ashley. Um, just a quick question about the uh, Wi-Fi, the downtown Wi-Fi proposal. Um, was that sort of the range? Like, do we get a range of like estimates? And well, that was it depends. Kind of the range? So, what what it was, and again, there are others that could talk more knowledgeably. But you, you all had put that on the list mm -hmm. as something you wanted to pursue. So we wanted to get prices for budget, and it was basically it depends on how how wide we cast the net. So you know how big we make the range of downtown Wi-Fi. That's the the price range. But then there's annual operating fee. So I just plucked out 80 out of that 60 to 90 is a budget number. I mean, it could be more, it could be less, but, um, and, and to try to keep the budget in the range that we were trying to keep it in, which is where we, we came in, you know, 80 to $100,000 for, for a new and expanded thing <clears throat> that it, from in our judgment wasn't, but obviously that's where you get to make those priority calls. So if you want to put that on and raise taxes or cut something else, you go for it. And the thing that I would, I, I was, I did a little research when I realized that it, um, it wasn't in the, the budget. Although I know that it's, it's still a fluid document, um, and there are organizations that offer 
the service that actually partner with municipalities to to kind of make these projects happen. Um, so I agree that at this point, given what we have to absorb, um, begrudgingly, I still stand by. Um, that is something that might be worth exploring um, because I, to me, internet access is sort of a, a fundamental thing at this point in, in our life. You know, if you can't look online for jobs or if you can't access, um, you know, your emails, for example, you know, it, it, I know <laughs> that it seems very strange to say that like it's almost debilitating, but if you don't have access to anything, you can't get a job, you can't, you know, get life done. Um, and so to me, that's sort of a, a fundamental, like, crux of, you know, what are we doing as a city to make sure that we're sort of leveling the access playing field? Um, and so I, I reached out to a couple of people that I know around the country who um, live in cities where they've implemented this, where they've partnered um, with organizations to see if I can get some information uh, to find a way where it, that wouldn't be the price tag that we would be paying, but that would also be reflective of our values and sort of what we're trying to do. Very interesting. Uh, Glenn. Um, I just want to uh, signal I am, uh, I think that a couple of the things on the not included list are high priorities for me. The energy plan, as Lauren mentioned. I think also the ash borer funds, it doesn't make much sense to me to, uh, to start treating the trees and then stop. Uh, and that seems like a small enough uh, piece that we should, we should continue that if I'm if I understand that number is just to continue that preventive treatment of the, the large and, high yeah, street we'll, we'll get more detail and on what that well entails. And it looks like Alec has some. I think we voted for. I can clarify that now. There you go. Oh, good. There you go. <laughs> Thanks. I just sent you an email, but oh, you did? you're not checking your emails. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just bend over here. Um, so the ash borer request last year was meant to be year one of a two year request. Um, and then after that, it would fall to zero. So um, that's a short story. I sent you a breakdown of the cost, but okay. we secured some of the things that we were going to buy this year for lower prices or through grant funding. And um, next year is just planned a couple larger purchases that we felt weren't feasible in one year. Uh, Connor. So is it 10000 or is it 6000 with the 4000 left over? Uh, it was, so it was supposed to be 14000 this yeah. year. Yeah. And then we, yeah, it's supposed to be 14,000, yeah. I, had, I thought we voted it for more than one year, but no, we'd have to go back to the motion. Well, you can't, you don't vote your budget for more than one year. No, so. but our commitment, I thought, was that we were going to start, because at one time we wanted more, and we were going to commit 10,000 to try to, well, to do the trees. Huh. But anyway. huh. uh, so I, I'm glad uh, you brought it up. Go ahead, Glenn. Uh, and then just the third uh, item on that list that, that stands out for me is the Homelessness Task Force. I don't want to steal their thunder. They're going to come next week and, and speak to us. But I think that that is uh, um, an emergent need that uh, I think it's pretty clear that we need to pay attention to it and, and do what we can, regardless of whether the state is doing their job um, as much as we can. So I expect to be fighting over that and the, uh, and the Public Art Commission as well. Okay. So we're going to get this document, play with some numbers, come back and have a conversation next week. Anything further about the budget? Okay. Well, thank you to, uh, to, yes. to you, yes. Bill, but also to really the rest of the staff. Um, so grateful for all of your work uh, with this, and um, and and to Todd especially. Um, thanks for putting putting this spreadsheet together and crunching all the numbers, and um, we're just very grateful. So, I'll just say on behalf of the staff, you know, we do work as a team to come up with this, and it's not an easy. So, I, hats off to them for for everyone pitching in, but also say that. It's very helpful to us, you know, I know sometimes it seems long, but that strategic planning session that we go through, I mean, you can see that does guide our decisions when we're making these things and setting those priorities is important. And it, as you know, it guides what comes before you. So, um, you know, we're hoping to even improve that more in 
future years, but um, we do try, you know, when, when we're having our conversations and we're trying to decide what to include and whatnot, that's kind of what we go back to and say, all right, well, you know, there's this. This is something that they said was important. And mm -hmm. So. Great. That's helpful. Well, thank you. Um, I'm going to move back to my other seat. Okay, so that I think is the end of our regular business. Uh, so uh, we're going to uh, start with council reports. Donna, are you okay to start? Sure. <coughs> Thank you. Yes. You're always so ready to go. Uh, yes, actually, I have a few things. And one I, I have meant to brought up before is that on our slides, we saw a shared youth pass with a bike route sign. <clears throat> and internationally, I see all over the place the wonderful signs that show a human pedestrian with a child holding hands with a line and a bike, which shows that it's shared. <clears throat> so I would hope we would move forward with a sign all throughout our shared youth path that truly is a shared youth path. Uh, and uh, Kevin reminded me, Downtown Streetscape Master Plan is having their meeting tomorrow night in this room, 6 to 7.30. And it's going to be a fluid meeting. You don't have to come and sit through all of that hour and a half. But if you show up, you'll be given an opportunity to see some of what they're working on and to share your opinion and leave. But you can stay for the whole thing if you want to hear other people's opinions. And I want to congratulate that the State House Ice Rink is going to hopefully open before Christmas. I somehow missed that $25,000 comes out of the city rec department budget. That's what the paper reported. Is that true? Yeah, that was to, to the last year. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, so the cost for the rec center came out last year. The rec center costs right now that we're incurring because we already purchased. So it, I, that's what I was asking, but it was an ongoing, it just listed there. No, the ongoing cost for the rec center is in staff right now because okay. we've already purchased the rec. Okay. Yeah, well. and, and you may recall the city used to run uh, an ice rink at the, the pool. Uh, the pool was frozen. We maintained that for skating. So when we switched to the rink, so the, the, basically the expenses we were incurring to run the, the pool skating is now switched to the skate, the state house skating. So it, yes, we're spending money, but it's the same money we were spending well, for skating. It just read twenty five thousand dollars city rec department. I went, wow. Okay. Um, and well, okay. I didn't. Maybe fine. Good. I'm glad for that clarity. The other thing, Times Argus today had an article reporting on the state panel on racial disparities, on inequalities. And I was just reading it and how much they're struggling. So we too are struggling, but so are they. But it would be helpful to stay in tune with what they're doing. So that's all. I'm good, I'll pass. Um, I wanna go back to uh, Elizabeth Parker at the beginning, I think, who was congratulating city staff on the uh, opening of that little stretch of shared use path between the uh, bridge and Main Street. I second that. It's really great to have that open. And today, uh, some of the fencing that was left on that site was taken away. And it's also great. And I can't wait for that big pile of dirt to go away. Um, <laughs> so thank you uh, for that. Um, I'll be at Baggy videos tomorrow morning, as usual. And I want to let everyone know that I am not going to stand and run again for this seat uh, in the spring. Um, it's been a, an honor to serve with you all and to represent my friends and neighbors in District 3. Um, and I look forward to the next few months of doing that, continuing to do that, but I will not stand up again, um, at least for now. Two years at a time is enough for me. Uh, <laughs> uh, and. Uh, I look forward to working with the city and some of the organizations that I've connected with through city council uh, in any way that I can. So thanks very much. Thank you. Ashley. Pat. Um, one thing I wanted to mention, and I, I assume that uh, the manager got uh, a copy of this uh, email. Let's just take a look. But we got an email. Um, yesterday from uh, from a resident about uh, Girton Park and uh, yes. it it's it's be 
the person said it's become a hangout, and part of my reaction is, well, yeah, pe what people do in parks is, in part, hang out. But, but the place is also, by the pictures we've seen, looking pretty, uh, pretty crummy and uh, garbagey. And uh, I hope we can have a response to that, so that uh, even though it costs money to send people there to clean it up. <laughs> We, we cleaned it up today. Um, it was really bad. Um, and there are people camping there, staying there. Um, and we talked to some of them, and they are going to try to prevent the, some of the trashing of the place. But it, it has, you know, ever since we've opened it, really, it's it, it's been a constant issue. I know there was some ask for maybe a trash receptacle, but our concern is that someone might start fires in it um, and that it's a wooden structure, so uh, that's not going to happen. But um, yeah, it's, you know, and we don't, I, I think the city wants to be careful and you know, we don't want to be taking on permanent cleanup of the place, but it was really bad and broken glass and um, needed to be taken care of. Can, can I back up on what he asked? Yeah. Because I'm so glad you remembered that. I mean, the concern is that everybody have access to it. So it's not about de denying those that there, but how do others get an opportunity? So I don't know if t Tony or others have an idea, but I think we have to do more than just, I think we have to work on this. I think it's part of that discussion of so social equity. Um, I'll, as long as we're talking, well, I'll, I'll talk about that more when it's my turn. Sorry, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to share that following up on the decision last meeting to um, make an investment in the Social and Economic Justice Advisory Committee, that group um, met this morning, and uh, we'll be putting some information out on Front Porch Forum for people who read that um, and updating the website, but we would love if people want to get involved in the uh, process as we develop a request for proposal for hiring the kind of expertise to help us um, with this process. So. Um, anyone who is is watching today, if you are a consultant, if you um, are interested in just getting involved in this group at this kind of exciting time as we develop this process and look how we really um, work together as a community to make progress in this, would love more folks to get involved, um, especially people who are less well represented in city government um, on the group right now. Um, all are welcome, but it would be great to kind of get more types of voices um, in that process as well. Um, so we'll be sending out more information in different uh, venues, but just wanted to put a plug for people who would like to get involved. We love, really appreciate that. Cool. Uh, so this past Saturday was uh, the VCAN conference uh, in Fairly, Vermont, which is uh, the Vermont uh, Energy Committee Action Network, uh, and it was a, a great Great event, lots of great workshops. Uh, just so you're aware, I uh, ended up speaking on behalf of the city of Montpelier uh, in terms of uh, what, uh, or a, a project that um, uh, I guess we're sort of working on, which is um, the uh, <laughs> movement of our um, uh, trimmers, I suppose, to electric. Uh, so thinking about how, uh, uh, anyway, I, I had a meeting with some folks over the summer from the rec department and um, where they got to try out, they got to demo some electric weed whackers and uh, thought they were great, which is awesome. Uh, and so we're going to be um, looking further into that and how that might uh, affect our equipment policy plan. Is that is that a fair thing to say, Emil? Sure. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so <laughs> we're looking into all sorts of things. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, Mary I just said it. Um, because I said it out loud to a whole bunch of people, you might be asked questions about that. So just wanted you to be aware. Um, and then also, what the else did you commit us to? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that was that was it. Uh, but then um, also, uh, there was a great uh, event uh, last night at the Garage Cultural Center about food security and climate change, and that was uh, very interesting. And uh, looking forward to having more conversation about food security and food sovereignty um, in Central Vermont. So uh, again, just it's on on my radar. Uh, I wanted to thank Glenn. Thank you so much for your time on the council. It has been a delight um, to have you here. We're sad to lose you. Uh, but you know, I mean, uh, 
you gotta you gotta do you gotta make good choices for you. So you know whatever works. Um, so but thank you, and I'm we'll I'll say this again too when it's uh, our, our last meeting. But anyway, um, so there's that, and then coming back to the uh, Girton Pocket Park, uh, I am it's. Yeah, it's beyond. It feels like it's it's um, sort of beyond just. Uh, uh, we'll just commit to cleaning it up periodically. Um, I would love to, and and I, I feel I will confess I feel a little partially responsible for this because I had a hand in making this happen, and and I feel like you know Tony was like you know this is going to happen, um, so <laughs> I, I appreciate appreciate you um, there with that. Uh, but one thought is that uh, you know we might need to just rethink some aspects of that park, um, or or not. You know, do, do we leave it because it is in a certain sense providing a, a service, um, and that's that's a hard conversation to have, um, and one that I would actually love to. Um, uh, I mean, I may just send this to uh, Ken Russell as well, but I, I know there's other multiple people here who uh, attend the um, Homelessness Task Force, but just thinking about that, I mean, that seems like it is uh, potentially right in the middle of why we formed that group in the first place, you know, the, thinking, thinking about the conflict between uh, the business community and uh, um, the homeless community. Uh, and so similarly, uh, you know, how can this, um, in that I, I have n don't have a great solution um, for it at this point, I would be very interested in the Homelessness Task Force's opinion as to what we can be doing. Is that something that you all feel like you can take to the task force and, and see if there's a, anyway. Agendas are full, but I think that is something that we should talk about. Yeah, um, because it, it needs a more long-term um, solution and and that's complicated. So we'll just uh, leave it there uh, for now. And uh, I, I think that's it for me. Yeah. Uh, first of all, water sewer bills are due Monday. Get that out there. Um, so you all know one of the two, the really, the really cool thing that I was kind of hoping to announce doesn't seem like it's happening. And that's that <laughs> an insider that I know put our department forward for a possible HBO uh, documentary that would follow election, you know, stuff around, and it doesn't seem like it's happening. Gosh, I was really hoping to be able to announce that. Um, but, and the other thing is, um, I'm the one who switched the flags. It's Tony's fault. He told me they were supposed to be the other way. So I take full responsibility. <laughs> That's it. Okay. Um, I don't have a lot. We've covered an awful lot tonight. We'll say that we're going to be announcing two really great hires for a finance director and assistant to the city manager um, tomorrow or Friday, uh, whenever we get around to writing the release and getting all the information together. <laughs> but we have great people, and uh, they're going to be joining our new team along with Cameron and all our new generation moving forward. So we're excited. All right, anything further? All right, so without uh, objection, we'll consider the meeting adjourned. 932.